In the past, I've ranked every episode of both Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad, and now all that's left to do is combine them to create the ultimate ranking of the entire Breaking Bad universe. And that means everything, including both shows, El Camino, and even Slippin' Jimmy. I won't be including those Breaking Bad mini-sodes in the video, or those like Better Call Saul, Puyo Hermanos training videos or anything like that, as I've already got enough to talk about, but maybe we can get around to those another time. Those of you who've seen my previous rankings will find a lot of this familiar, but my opinions on Better Call Saul have changed quite a bit since the last time I talked about it, so be on the lookout for that. With the sheer amount of episodes in this list, a lot of the placements around the middle are going to be pretty arbitrary, up until the top 50 or so. We've got over 130 episodes to cover, so let's not waste any more time and jump into my ultimate ranking of the entire Breaking Bad universe. Number 133, The Exorcist. To the surprise of no one, a Slip and Jimmy episode gets the honour of being at the bottom of this list. I was actually tempted to just put all six episodes as one combined last place, but that wouldn't be any fun now, would it? I still cannot believe that this show exists. For the two of you watching who have no idea what the hell I'm talking about, Slip and Jimmy is an animated series about none other than Slip and James himself, and the wacky antics he got up to with his best pal Marco. Thankfully there's only 6 episodes, and they're all less than 10 minutes, which makes me wonder what the point of this even was. All 6 episodes were just dumped onto AMC Plus the same day Plan and Execution aired, which makes it pretty obvious they just wanted to release it, and move on while everyone was distracted with Howard's wacky hijinks. And it seems to have mostly worked, since I don't think a single person actually watched Slip and Jimmy. Even mega BBU losers like myself. If it wasn't for this video, I probably never would have. Anyway, deciding which episode to put at the bottom of the pile was a bit of a challenge, as they're all incredibly painful to sit through. Eventually I decided it had to be the second episode, where Jimbo and Marco are put in detention and have to deal with their teacher being possessed by a demon. Yeah, not entirely sure if this episode's supposed to be canon or not. And remember how I said these episodes are less than 10 minutes? Well they managed to feel like an eternity anyway. The voice actors for Jimmy and Marco, and pretty much everyone else are just excruciatingly annoying, and the art style isn't very attractive either. And the episode itself stinks as well, but you probably already knew that. In fact, we're going to do a speed round of these next few episodes, because I really don't want to talk about them any longer than necessary. Number 132, Speed Date. Jimmy tries to ask out his crush on a bus while wacky hijinks ensue. It sucks. Number 131, After Bedtime. Jimmy and Marco go on a mission in the middle of the night to get to some comic book event. Marco gets stuck on a rope, there's a guy who can't count to free. They get in a taxi with a pirate, it stinks. Number 130, Cool Hand Jimmy. The last episode of a series has Jimmy going to summer camp for some reason. Uh, things happen, uh, it blows. Number 129, Fistful of Snowballs. The first episode of a series is a shitty western knockoff, but instead of it being hot, it's cold. And the snowballs. Also, most of the episode is in this annoying letterbox aspect ratio to make it more cinematic or something. It smells. And finally, number 128, City Flights. The least bad Slip and Jimmy episode is still not good by any means, but is actually tolerable for one main reason. There's no voice acting. Yeah, this one is a lame silent film knockoff, which means it's in black and white with whimsical piano music playing the whole time. And if that means we don't have to hear terrible dialogue coming out of Jimmy's stupid mouth, then I'm all for it. The plot of this one is Jimmy going on a silly little adventure to get something for Chuck. Yeah, Chuck is in this episode, and this episode only. Now if I were in charge of making a shitty Jimmy McGill cartoon, I would think that the obvious thing to make it about would be Jimmy's antics and conflicts with his brother Chuck but instead they decided to relegate him to just this one episode. Oh well, this episode still had me watching the whole thing like this, and I just want to move on from this godforsaken show now, so let's get into the real episodes at last. Number 127, Snow Globe. Okay, I know I said we can get to the real episodes now, but we have to talk about this first. For those of you wondering what on earth a snow globe even is, it's a short film released a bit after El Camino came out, and when I say short, I mean short. This thing is barely over two minutes long. It features everyone's favourite lovable child murderer Todd trying to riz up Lydia on the phone while making one of his world famous snow globes. I'm guessing this was just a deleted scene from El Camino that they decided to just release as a separate thing after the fact, because I can't think of a good reason for his existence other than that. For what it's worth though, it is pretty good stuff, with Todd's fruitless attempts at getting into Lydia's wood chipper being something we can all relate to. Unfortunately, the fact that it's only two minutes means I can't realistically put it above any of the proper episodes from the other shows, so we're gonna have to leave it here for now. 
If you're ever hankering for more Todd content, you can watch this whole short of my AMC YouTube channel. Unless those fuckers blocked it in your country because they hate you. Nothing a little VPN won't get past. Number 126. Down. This episode is not really bad per se, but it isn't exactly the most fun time of the world. Down is fittingly a downer episode, where Jesse has to deal with constant failure, while Walt has to deal with Skylar not wanting anything to do with him after the whole second cell phone debacle. This episode continues the season 2 trend of a pointless black and white teddy bear cold opens, which I just don't care for at all, but we'll talk more about those later on. Jesse is broke and needs money from Walt, but he only gives him $600 because he's a stingy <laughs> Then his parents kick him out of his house because he's such a screw-up. I do like the scene of Jesse and his mum because you can kind of sympathise with both sides of the argument. Bitch. Then we have the scene where Jesse tries to rekindle his friendship with this guy from high school, but he gets rejected there as well. Eventually he finds a new home in a porta potty. Meanwhile Walt tries to get Skylar to stop thinking he's a liar, which doesn't work because he's a liar. He takes his rage out on Jesse, and they have a fight for the ages in the RV. Jesse wins and gets his money, while Skylar gets judged for smoking while being pregnant. Just kind of a whatever episode honestly. Number 125. Cancer Man. This episode is where everyone finds out about Walt's cancer, and the ramifications of that. Skylar tries to blame the chemicals Walt worked with 20 years ago, Marie immediately jumps into working out the best next move for him, and Hank assures him that he'll take care of a family if the worst happens, which Walt doesn't seem to appreciate. Walt isn't interested in getting treatment, so Junior calls him out for being a bitch. This episode is the first time we see Skinny Pete and Combo, who are very impressed with Jesse's new product. He tries to stay at his parents' house for a bit, but doesn't even manage to last the whole episode before being kicked out. Jesse goes to Walt's house for a BJ and pays him $4,000. Walt takes his anger out on the infamous Ken Wins, who can't seem to catch a break from his Sigmas messing with him, and does an epic walking away from explosion moment. Number 124. Bit by a dead bee. Walt's genius plan to explain away his absence in the previous episode is to just get naked and go to the store. It works for some reason, and Walt gets sent to the hospital where he pretends to conveniently have forgotten everything that's happened since he disappeared. Skylar doesn't seem to be satisfied with this explanation though, and the doctors aren't going to let Walt leave until they're sure he's good to go. Eventually he gives up and just tells the psychiatrist that he just left the house to get away from his annoying family. He then somehow manages to sneak out of the hospital, check on his money, and then take a depressing bus ride back to the hospital without anyone noticing. When he eventually gets home, Skylar asks him if he has a second cell phone, to which he pulls out another one of his unconvincing lies. Hank tries to interrogate Jesse, who says that he was at the hotel just getting Wendy's from Wendy all weekend, even though his car was found at Tuco's place with a ton of money in it. After Wendy vouches for him and Hector chooses to shit his pants instead of exposing him, they're left with no choice but to just release Jesse. Number 123. Open House. This is often regarded as the worst episode of a show, and it's the lowest rated one on IMDb, apart from that other episode which we'll get to later. The episode treats us to the return of one of the most important plotlines in the show, Marie's kleptomania. It's so crucial that the title of the episode is in reference to it, with Marie going to various open houses to steal random crap. Eventually the real estate agent catches wind of what's going on, and when she confronts Marie they have a fight for the ages, leading to her crying like a baby. Meanwhile Walt's mad because Gus installed security cameras in the super lab, but Jesse doesn't seem to care, and is more interested in going go-karting. Walt commits one of the most evil crimes in the entire show when he turns down Jesse's offer, leaving him to go karting by himself, and then back home to his 24-7 rager taking place in his house. Skylar insists on getting a move on with their big car wash purchase, but Walt isn't interested until she brings up how Bogdan insulted his manliness, which sets him off and makes him intent on getting the car wash, even though Sol wants him to use the nail salon instead. In a ploy to get bogged on to let them buy the car wash, Skylar gets Sol's lackey to troll him into thinking he has contaminated water or something, and he ends up agreeing to Skylar's offer of 800 grand. Tim Roberts visits Hank to get his input on the Bedeka case, thinking that he was involved with some sort of meth super lab. He doesn't seem interested at first, but eventually he does start reading Gail's notebook, setting in motion his return to the Heisenberg case. Number 122, 737. I know there's been a lot of early season 2 of the bottom of this list, and that's because it's probably the least good period of the show in my opinion. The opener of season 2 introduces us to the worst cold opens in the series, the teddy bear flash forwards. Maybe if they amounted to something good it wouldn't be so bad, but they kinda don't, so they're just a chore to sit through and rewatch. The episode proper starts off right where season 1 ended off, with Tuco beating that guy to a pulp and getting hyped over it. After trying and failing to save the guy, Walt calculates that he needs precisely $737,000 to cover his family's future, which he doesn't seem to think is enough just a year later. Walt gets home and tries to fucking Skylar, which is a little bit disturbing. 
She just chalks it up to him being stressed over the cancer. Jesse gets a gun from a doghouse and lays out his plan to deal with Tuco, since it's only a matter of time before he wastes them. But Walt points out a bunch of cinema sins and doesn't think Jesse has the guts to go through with it anyway. Walt has a better idea to poison Tuco with ricin by presenting it as their latest and greatest meth invention. This kicks off the show-long Chekhov's ricin plot, which doesn't end up being used on someone until the very last episode. Before they can execute their plan, Tuco ruins it by kidnapping both of them and taking them to a much better episode. Meanwhile, Skylar is pissing at Marie over the whole stolen tiara thing, and when Hank tries to get her to get over it, she unleashes an epic rant about how shitty her life is, which Anna Gunn acts out perfectly. Marie also commits one of the most brutal murders of a show in this episode. Number 121. Breakage. Jesse is keen to move out of his porta potty home and meets Jane for the first time while house searching. Walt and Jesse are determined to get back to business after the Tuco debacle since both of them have expenses, and after some arguing about who gets to call the shots, Jesse decides they're going to use their own dealers to distribute the product instead of dealing with another Tuco. Jesse recruits the Dream Team and Badger, Skinny Pete, and Combo to sling meth for 2500 an ounce, with 2000 going back to Jesse and Walt. Everything goes great until Petey immediately gets himself robbed by Spooge and his ATM loving lady. Walt goes alpha mode on Jesse and demands he deal with them. Hank is in a bad mood after his detective skills get him a new gig at El Paso, which for some reason he's not very happy about. So he decides to take the day off and brew Schrader Brow instead, which leads to them exploding in the middle of the night and making him also shoot Marie. Kind of just a whatever episode minus Jesse meeting Jane, which is good. Number 120. Carrot and Stick. Finally, we get to talk about Better Call Saul. After my last watch through of the show, I'm now officially deeming this as my least favourite episode. This episode aired back to back with a first when season 6 came out, and by itself, it honestly feels pretty weak. The main noteworthy things are Nacho breaking out of Gus's trap and having a silly little shootout with the twins, and Jimmy and Kim doing some trolling with the returning Kettlemans. Seeing Betsy Kettlemilk is back in the show was a highlight of the season for me, and her and Craig's scenes are easily the best part of this episode. Nacho's plot takes up quite a bit of a runtime, which is valid since he's only in three episodes, but the action scene at the end with the twins is just stupid as hell, with him refusing to do anything other than walk menacingly towards Nacho. Kim revealing her evil side to Betsy is pretty depressing to watch, seeing how far she's fallen from the early days of the show. Gus does a sit down with Hector to comfort him about Lalo's demise, but the idiot makes it blatantly obvious that Lalo's still kicking around, and this line reading by Giancarlo is pretty badass. Lalo Salamanca lives. This episode also features the grand return of Aaron Brill, so thumbs up for that. They said they wanted to talk to someone in charge, and I'm just a quote, prepubescent intern. Obviously not a bad episode, but the other ones have a bit more going on in my eyes. Number 119, Dedicado a Max. Mike's storyline for the first half of season 5 was basically just to get him and Gus back to where they were in season 4, and this episode is the conclusion of that, with Gus appealing to Mike's Sigma revenge grind set. I think this plot is probably the least interesting of all the Mike stuff in the show, but it's not terrible or anything. Thankfully, the Jimmy Kim plot is really good this episode, with Saul pulling endless tricks to stop Akka's home from being bulldozed. My favourite is probably when he makes it look like the house is right next to an archaeological dig site. Kim does a Kevin Wachtel impression, and we get the return of Trevor, now with a sexy beard. Seeing Kim get angry at Rich for being right about her throwing the Akka case is annoying, but this is a big season for Kim so I'll let it slide. And as the title of the episode suggests, we get even more evidence of Gus being gay for Max. Number 118, Talk. This episode features the start of Jimmy's tenure at CC Mobile, so for that reason alone, this is already a good episode. But on top of that, we have Kim beginning her public defender work, Mike trolling at the support group meeting, and most importantly, Nacho and the twins shooting a bunch of guys for no reason. I actually do like this shootout, since the twins don't act as stupid as they usually do in other action scenes, beyond them deciding to go in by themselves in the first place. And Nacho even gets a slice of the action, securing his first kill in the process. This is one of the few times the twins actually do something of note, so that is a bonus. We also get the only time we ever see younger Mike, or at least we kind of see him. This episode does kind of suffer from my least favourite aspect of Mike's story in the show, the like back and forth about whether he is actually working for Gus or not. It doesn't matter that much though, since next episode is when the Super Lab plot begins, and things are smooth sailing for the rest of the season. Number 117. A no rough stuff type deal. The finale of season 1 wasn't originally going to be for finale, but thanks to the writer's strike it ended up having to be, and yeah, you can kind of tell. It's not a bad episode by any means, but it doesn't really have that finale oomph that it probably should have. 
Jesse and Walter are now in business with Tuco and need to cook four pounds of meth to appease him, even though they don't have enough pseudo to make it. So they decide to switch to a methylamine cook instead, which means they have to steal a barrel of the stuff. Jesse knows guys who can do it for them, but Walt thinks they can do it themselves. They end up executing the greatest heist in history, stealing a barrel and slowly carrying it away. Even that idiot Hank knew that you should roll it instead, but Walt later learns from this mistake. Him and Hank have a debate over the legality of things, and Skylar is surprised when Marie presents her with an extravagant tiara at her baby shower, which she definitely acquired for legal means. When she tries to return it, the owner tries to get her arrested, so she pretends to go into labor to get out of it, like a true girl boss. Walt and Jesse manage to get Tuco the meth they promised, now with the signature blue color thanks to the methylamine. Tuco thanks him by beating the shit out of his henchman when he tries to assert dominance, who seemingly hasn't learned anything from the last time he tried to back Tuco up. Tuco says he'll see them next week, ending the episode on a pleasant note. Number 116. No Mass. The first episode of season 3 introduces us to everyone's favourite assassins, the twins, and also introduces us to the best character in the show, Angsty Walt. Hot off the heels of being dumped by Skylar, the start of season 3 is all about him basically falling apart. He seems to feel pretty guilty about the whole plane crash thing, so he goes to burn his money, but he quickly realises how stupid that is and throws it into the pool of insanity. While Hank is helping him move out, Walt tries to flex his half a million cash, but Hank just laughs in his face because he knows Walt's actually a broke loser. Then at the school, Carmen tries to get Walt to say a few words about how the plane crash affected him, but he instead launches into this spiel about how it actually wasn't that bad in the grand scheme of things, and ends up just making himself look like an idiot. Skylar visits him at his new bachelor pad, and finally gets him to admit that he's a meth cook, and doesn't stay to hear him explain the difference between manufacturing and dealing drugs. Gus tries to strike while the iron is hot and get Walt to start cooking again, but he's too depressed to have any interest. Meanwhile Jesse's having a fun time at therapy planting flowers, and after a session with the group leader where he reveals he ran over his daughter while drunk, he decides to accept that he's responsible for Jane's death in the plane crash, which doesn't seem to sit right with Walt for some reason. Number 115 Mabel. This is another episode that people give a lot of shit for nothing happening, mainly the scene where Mike takes his car apart for 56 hours. But for me, that scene is one of my favourite Mike moments in the whole show, and is a perfect example of the series' attention to detail, and letting the audience soak in the vibes of a car being taken apart piece by piece. You could say the whole mystery of who was trailing Mike is made kind of pointless by the fact that it was already pretty obvious who it was at the end of season 2, but it's still entertaining watching Mike try to figure it out. It's nice to see Jimmy and Chuck connect for a fleeting moment before Chuck brings us back to reality, and his manipulation of Ernesto and then promptly firing him shows just how much of an arsehole he can be. A great intro to the best season of the show. Number 114. Kafka-esque. Walt and Jesse are finally officially at work in the super lab, with the cold open showing us just how efficient the whole operation is under Gus's watchful eye. While weighing their latest batch, Jesse does some number crunching and realizes that the $1.5 million they're each making are pennies on the dollar compared to what Gus is raking in. But Walt just brushes it off as classic capitalism, with some delicious future hypocrisy to boot. You are now a millionaire, and you're complaining? We have suffered and bled literally for this business, and I will not throw it away for nothing. I don't know how else to say it, Mr. White. Five million dollars is it nothing? Jesse complains about his new job of a support group, with a pretty accurate depiction of the whole thing. My boss is a dick, the owner's super dick. I'm not worthy or whatever to meet him, but I guess everybody's scared of the dude. Place is full of dead-eyed douchebags, the hours suck and nobody knows what's going on, so... In another meeting he tells this great story about his woodworking teacher back in high school and how he motivated him to make the best wooden box anyone's ever seen, which he supposedly ended up giving to his mother. Jesse decides to go full dickhead mode and gets Badger and Skinny Pete to start coming to the meetings so they control all the recovering addicts into relapsing. Saul introduces Jesse to the world of money laundering and offers him the once in a lifetime opportunity to own a nail salon since he's probably still salty that Mrs. Nguyen kicked him out all those years ago. Jesse isn't interested though, especially when Saul doesn't give him the laundering discount that he gave Walt previously. Meanwhile Walt finds out how Hank survived the twins ambush and meets with Gus so he can assure his safety while also netting a cool 15 mil a year deal. He goes drunk driving to celebrate and almost crashes into a truck. Marie is fretting over Hank's extensive medical bills and suddenly Skylar offers to pay for them and comes up with this elaborate story where Walt made a ton of money gambling like a true Sigma male. She says she was so good at lying because she learned from the best, even though Walt was like the worst liar in the world whenever it came to Skylar. Number 113, 
38 snub. This episode shows just how depressed everyone is about their situation, with Walt buying a gun from Lawson in a desperate attempt to get rid of Gus, but instead he's been replaced by Tyrus. Walt tries going straight to Gus's house to get the job done, but is stopped before he even reaches the door, since Gus has FNAF security camera spying on him. There was a bit of questioning as to whether the person calling Walt was Mike, Gus, or Tyrus, and it turns out it's actually Tyrus, which is weird because I'm pretty sure this is the only time we hear him say Walt's name. Go home, Walter. In a desperate move, he tries to convince Mike to join the anti-Gus club, but all he gets out of it is a couple bruises. I also love the Wayfarer advert from Saul that's playing on the TV, as well as Mike's reaction. Jesse is probably at his lowest point after killing Gale, and throws a 24-7 rager to distract himself. He tries to keep it going for as long as possible, but eventually everyone including Skinny Pete and Badger leave. Hank is in full mode, constantly dismissing Marie while he works for his physical therapy, only acknowledging her when it's regarding his oh-so-precious minerals. Skylar scopes out the car wash and tries to make an offer to Bogdan, but is shut down since he still has a hate boner for Walt, after he insulted his luscious eyebrows. Number 112. Nippy. For those of you who watched my original Better Call Saul ranking, you probably remember Johnny Cooper crashing the video to rant about how much he hates Nippy. This time I'll be giving my take on it, which you'll hopefully find a bit more agreeable. Despite the rather low placement on this list, I actually do really dig this episode. I think its biggest detriment is coming right after the juggernauts of episodes 7, 8, and 9. Those episodes are so insanely good and going from that last scene of fun and games to a wacky heist episode with some lovable goofballs was quite the pace breaker. A year later that switch up isn't nearly as jarring, but at the time it left me and many others feeling like something was missing. I still think some kind of episode that could slot in between fun and games and this episode would help a lot, but who knows what that would entail. Anyways, talking about the episode itself, what I like most about it is that whole heist and the build up to it. The show is no stranger to awesome montages, and the one with Gene feeding this fat fuck Cinnabons is one of the best. I also really do like the Jeff and Gene dynamic in this episode. Cooper may have been right about his assessment of Jeff as a more menacing figure, but there was enough left vague about his personality in his Don Harvey form that I can totally buy him actually being a wimp loser once Gene gets the upper hand. I like the Walter White reference they put in there for us to clap at. I like the part where Jeff falls over. There's just a lot to love about Nippy. The only reason I haven't put it higher, as lame a reason as it is, I simply rather watch the other episodes more than this one. With the other Gene episodes together, I think Nippy makes a lot more sense, but by itself it's a bit of an oddball. I wish I could love it as much as some of you do. Number 111. The Guy For This. Hank and Gomez joined the show this episode, and I have mixed feelings. It does make sense for them to be here for the Crazy 8 plot, but their back and forth banter just feels forced to me. I may be biased though since I wasn't exactly the biggest Hank fan when watching Breaking Bad. It's also kind of distracting that Gomez's actor couldn't be bothered to shave his goatee, but it doesn't really matter. Thankfully everything else in the episode is very good. Jimmy meeting Lalo was something that we were waiting for from the moment Lalo joined the show. Lalo mentions that Tuco told him about Jimmy, which makes me a bit disappointed we never got a Tuco Lalo scene in the show. Kim's struggle with her pro bono work versus Mesa Verde comes to a head with Aka, who Mesa Verde is trying to force off his property so they can build a call center there. The most memorable part of this episode is probably the cold open, which very artfully shows Jimmy's ice cream from the previous episode being consumed by ants, which he sees later on in the episode. You can make 500 hours worth of video essays based on this scene alone. Number 110. Axe and Grind. Season 6 was giving hints of Howard's personal life, like his therapy session in Hit and Run, and here we finally get to meet his wife Cheryl, and it's immediately obvious that they don't exactly have the best relationship. Her dumping his perfectly made coffee into her travel mug may be the single saddest moment in the entire show. Getting to see how shitty Howard's life seems is obvious set up for next episode, and let's just say it's all downhill from here for him. Jimmy and Kim visit Caldera for some drugs, and we get a reference to the vacuum guy, which thankfully doesn't go any further than this one shot of a business card. This is also the last time we see Caldera, which is sad. Lalo's antics in Germany continue from last episode, and this scene of him versus Casper is pretty crazy, except for the fact that it's so fucking dark you can't even see anything. We also finally get an idea of what Jimmy and Kim's grand plan is, and the broken arm reveal at the end of the episode is one of the funniest moments of the season. Imagine if this was a mid-season finale instead of planned execution, though. That cliffhanger would just be terrible. Number 109. Marco. In my last ranking, I was pretty mean to this episode, but I've come around on it now. I like seeing Jimmy in a different environment after getting used to the status quo over the season, and Marco's quite the lovable scamp. I really love the first few scenes of Jimmy passing on the chalk duties to Howard and making amends. 
Glad that they remained good friends throughout the rest of the show. Kim's reasoning for not telling James about Chuck makes sense, even though it didn't really end up working. And then we have one of the best scenes of a show, Jimmy's Chicago sunroof meltdown. No notes on this scene, just hilariously acted by Bob Odenkirk. You know what? Any of this stuff you want, come get it. Kitty cat notebooks for everybody. It's just a shame that we never got another flashback with a shitty young Jimmy Week to see the death canning happen on screen. But maybe it's best left to the imagination. The montage of Jimmy and Marco doing their slip and Jimmy thing is excellent as usual, and the Kevin Costner moment is classic. The last scene where Jimmy tells Mike about his plan to stop being a lame loser is a great moment to end the season on, and leads pretty perfectly into season 2. Good finale overall, but doesn't really compare to the other ones in my book. Number 108. Slip. Jimmy does a slip and fall, Nacho slips some sugar pills into Hector's jacket, and Kim slips Howard a check. The scene where Nacho does the pill swap was one of the most tense scenes in the whole show for me, and this is weak source compared to what Nacho goes through in the rest of the show, and I do love a good bottle throwing training montage. Jimmy being helpful to his fellow community service workers could be seen as setting up his popularity in prison at the end of the show, but probably not. We get to see Mike's disdain for normal citizens being killed by people in the game, when he uses a metal detector to find the Good Samaritan's dead body so that his family can get closure. This obviously parallels Howard's death when Mike is forced to bury him in a random hole, so no one will ever know the truth, at least until Kim confesses years later. Chuck begins his journey to rid himself of EHS, which will hopefully lead to him living a prosperous life free of any illness. Number 107. IFT. Walt and Skylar's divorce back and forth reaches a stalemate, with him moving back in and her calling the cops on him, but they can't make him leave since he's just hanging out. So Walt does get to move back into the house, but Skylar isn't going to make it pleasant for him, making him sleep on the floor and piss in the sink. Skylar goes to a divorce lawyer slash therapist and tells her that Walt's a drug dealer since they have attorney-client privilege. She obviously recommends that Skylar sue Walt and make the divorce official, but now she has doubts. Walt justifies his criminal activities by saying the money will get the kids through college and whatnot, and she thanks him for it by fucking Ted. She drops the news on Walt when she gets home, finally revealing what IFT stands for. I fucked Ted. Jesse isn't having much of a better time, with him repeatedly calling Jane's phone to hear her voicemail, until Saul interrupts to get him to ask Walt to start cooking again. Hank's in a mood after he finds out he's wanted back at El Paso, and takes his anger out on a bunch of randos at a bar, and abuses his status as a cop to get away with it. The Salamunkers have a meeting with Gus to complain about how they want to kill Walt, but Gus vetoes it since he needs him for his business. Hector's probably so done with Gus's bullshit at this point since he knows he killed Lalo, but it's not like he can say anything about it. Number 106. Sabrosito. This episode is split pretty much perfectly in half between the Gus plot and the real plot, with the first half being Hector's field trip to Pollo's Hermanos to troll the customers, and the second half laying the groundwork for the big face-off against Chuck next episode. Gus shows what a good boss he is by giving a rousing speech about how cool he is to his workers, and this is the exact moment when Lyle decided to dedicate the rest of his life to Pollo's Hermanos. We get the return of a yellow piss filter from Breaking Bad, along with Don Eladio very subtly foreshadowing his own demise. This episode also has the only time Mike and Chuck ever interacted, which is a shame, but it also makes this episode stand out more. The scene where Jimmy, Kim, Howard, and Chuck argue about the details of Jimmy's confession is great, and it's revealed to the surprise of no one that Chuck has a copy of a tape Jimmy destroyed, which ends up working out in Jimmy's favour next episode. Overall, a damn good episode that gets overshadowed by what comes after it. Number 105. Shotgun. This is the episode where Mike and Jesse become best friends, which is probably due to Mike actually being Jesse from the future. It's kind of funny how the cold open of this episode makes it seem like it's going to be some super tense action-packed thing, with Walt frantically speeding around thinking he's about to get killed, and then the rest of the episode is just Mike and Jesse driving around in silence. They're picking up random dead drops all over the city, and Jesse thinks he's there to be Mike's bodyguard, which makes him a bit triggered. You are not the guy. You're not capable of being the guy. I had a guy, but now I don't. You are not the guy. Not entirely sure who Mike's guy was, and Better Call Saul doesn't exactly make it clear who it was. Closest I can think of is like Nacho, but even that's stretching it. It definitely can't be Victor, because it's pretty obvious Mike never liked that annoying to begin with. Walt has to do with cooking by himself, and gets mad because he sucks at driving forklifts. Him and Skylar finalise the car wash deal, and when Skylar hears his voice message from the cold open, she gets turned on by it and they have sexy times in the bedroom. 
While doing their last pickup, some shady guys show up, so Jesse takes matters into his own hands and smashes into them with Mike's car. We later find out that it was all a setup by Gus to make Jesse think he's an awesome badass. Lastly, there's this hilarious scene where the family has dinner at Hank and Marie's place where Walt gets drunk, and when Hank says Gail was a genius, he tells him that he was obviously just copying someone else's work, and Heisenberg is actually still out there. My favourite Walt moments are the one where he acts like a complete idiot, and this one might just take the cake. So to my eye, all this brilliance looks like nothing more than just simple rote copying. Probably of someone else's work. Well, this genius of yours. Maybe he's still out there. Number 104. Namaste. There's some really good scenes in this episode, with the standout being Jimmy's lunch with Howard, which shows just how far Howard has come compared to where he was in season 4, and how Jimmy still holds a lot of resentment towards him, which we obviously see at the end of the episode when he throws the bowling balls on his car. There's also the courtroom scene with a fake defendant, which is classic Saul Goodman shenanigans. My main issue with this episode is Hank and Gomez's involvement, who were introduced in the previous episode. Something about their dialogue just feels off to me in a way that I can't really explain, and I don't give a shit about their stakeout adventure. I do like the parallel scenes of Gus tormenting Lyle with cleaning the fry repeatedly, which is both amusing and good insight into how Gus is feeling at that moment. Not a bad episode, but not a standout by any means. Number 103. Abacu. This episode is sandwiched between the Fly episode and Half Measures, and as such often gets forgotten when discussing the show. Which is a shame, because there's some pretty great stuff here, like Skylar meeting Saul for the first time, since she wants to be sure Walt's doing his criminal stuff properly. Pretty much every line of dialogue in this scene is just hilarious. And Saul begins his mission of trying to get every character in the show to buy the laser tag place supposedly owned by Price. Skylar isn't interested though, and decides they should buy the car wash Walt used to work at instead. She also offers to be Walt's money launderer, and when Walt tries to shut her down, she reveals she never signed the divorce papers, meaning that they would have spousal privilege, much like Jimmy and Kim did. Meanwhile, Jesse continues his epic plan to make all the recovering addicts of a support group relapse, and when Pete and Badger start to feel bad about it, he decides to show them how a true alpha operates, by hooking up with Andrea. But when he finds out she has a kid, he suddenly gains a moral compass and calls her a terrible mother. Thankfully, Andrea thinks he's cool, so he doesn't end up fumbling the bag. Things get extra interesting when Jesse realizes her brother is the kid who killed Combo. He does some detective work and finds out that the meth those guys are selling is blue, which means they're part of Gus's squad. Hank's being a to Marie as usual, when he finds out he's going to be released from the hospital, claiming he isn't going to leave until he can walk again. Gus invites Walt over to his house for a playdate, where he cooks whatever this is and makes some remarks that would incline us to believe that Gus has kids like Walt. But if you've watched my video analyzing Gus, then you would know that he's just lying about it to make Walt relate to him more, since there's zero other mentions of Gus's supposed kids throughout both this show and Better Call Saul. This episode also has the last appearance of Jane, in a flashback to when they went to the Vagina Museum. Number 102. Rebecca. This is the episode where Kim really comes into her own as a character, after Jimmy's advert stunt for Davis and Maine ends up with her down in the cornfields. The montage of her trying to drum up new business to get back in Howard's good graces is one of my favourites. The opening of this episode is one of the best examples of why Chuck hates Jimmy so much, when Rebecca laughs at all of Jimmy's lawyer jokes, but Chuck's is an epic fail. Jimmy also starts getting babysat by Aaron Brill, which he definitely is not happy about. This episode probably also has Howard at his most asshole -ish, to the point where Chuck has to step in to get Kim out of Doc Review. Thankfully, Howard eventually gets what he deserves for that. Number 101. Grey Matter. This episode formally introduces us to Walt's former associates, Gretchen and Elliot, when he and Skylar go to Elliot's birthday party. Walt's an insecure little baby and gets flustered when someone asks him what university he teaches at, and this is the first time we get to really see the magnitude of his ego and pride, when Elliot offers him a job back at Grey Matter so he can afford to pay for his cancer treatment. Now any normal person would jump at this opportunity, especially since it's the kind of work Walt's supposed to be passionate about, but the idea of someone else helping him is just so insulting that he would rather cook meth instead. Walt comes home to the family waiting for him with the dreaded talking pillow, where they say their thoughts on Walt refusing cancer treatment. Hank wants him to get it, Junior just wants him to die, and Marie sides with Walt wanting to die on his own terms, which makes Skylar pretty mad. Meanwhile, Jesse's trying to get back into the meth game with Badger instead of Walt, since his attempt to get a real job was an epic fail, but their cooking yields less than ideal results, leading to them having an epic fight scene. Walt changes his mind and decides to get cancer treatment, and when Gretchen calls him to accept their money, he dismisses her and goes to Jesse's house to get back on the meth grind. 
Number 100. Something Beautiful. This episode has the most famous action scene in the Breaking Bad universe, the Hummel heist, ending with a beta cuck chasing his runaway car after Jimmy hijacks it. The scene where Jimmy tries to convince Mike to do the heist would feel like a classic early season scene if it weren't for the fact that Chuck's death is still fresh in everyone's mind, which comes back at the end of the episode with a letter. It can be hard to decipher what Chuck's intentions were, but the important part of the scene isn't the letter itself but Jimmy's reaction, or more so the lack of one. Kim's reaction to it is pretty much the exact opposite and goddamn Ray Seahorn is a good actress. Meanwhile, Nacho is having the worst day of his life after being shot by Victor and Tyrus for Gus's little scheme, and they get way too much enjoyment out of this. Thankfully, Caldera comes in clutch like always. Kim has too much boring Mesa Verde work, so she hires Viola to help her. And most importantly, we get the return of local sex offender Gail, who tries to impress Gus with his chemistry skills. Number 99. 51. This episode has one of the most bizarre cold opens, where Walt decides to sell his Aztec for a whopping $50, and gets a new whip for himself, and then for Junior as well, while dated dubstep music plays. Walt continues his season 5 arc of being the most annoying guy in the room by being a to Skylar on his birthday, basically forcing her to make his bacon into a 51 like she's supposed to. After she seemingly tries to drown herself in the pool of insanity, Hank and Marie take the kids and Walt argues with Skylar about her not appreciating his Sigma lifestyle, to the point where she says she's just going to wait for the cancer to kill him. This scene, along with all the other Skylar scenes early in this season, is just uncomfortable to watch honestly. Meanwhile Lydia's methylamine guy gets busted by the feds, meaning Jesse has to go collect the barrels instead, but when he's getting it with a the forklift they discover a GPS tracker under it. Mike immediately assumes Lydia's in cahoots with the cops, so he heads off to whack her, but Jesse doesn't think that's very nice of him. For an episode directed by Ryan Johnson, this one doesn't really stand out compared to his other two episodes. Number 98. Barley High. I actually had this episode at the bottom of my last Soul ranking, and to be honest I'm not sure why. I love the cold open with Jimmy being unable to get sleep in his cushy Davis and Main apartment and doing a bunch of random activities to distract himself. Pretty perfect use of a sleepwalk song here. The lawyer side of this episode sees Kim having a shit time with Howard sending her to court by herself, giving her documents to review during lunchtime, all while Jimmy is leaving her lovely voicemails trying to get back in her good graces. Eventually they're able to bond over Scammy and other guy and all is good again. There's also this fantastic scene with Kim and the goat Rich Schweikart, where he talks about how he was in a similar position to Kim once. Basically any scene with Rich is an instant 10 out of 10. I really like the last moment of the episode with Jimmy destroying the cup holder on his company car so he can fit his world's second best lawyer mug in there. Meanwhile Mike is minding his business until Salamanca goons show up to give him a hard time, but he's able to easily beat them up in this awesome scene that's a bit of a callback to his stealth mission back in Breaking Bad. Then the twins show up to stand there and do nothing, so he goes over to Hector's joint to sort him out. This scene is pretty good, minus Hector's Spanish line deliveries being almost as bad as mine. So yeah, pretty good episode overall, no idea why I had it so low in my original video. Number 97. 50% off. There's some pretty wacky hijinks in this episode, like Nacho's parkour adventure to grab drugs from a building seconds away from it being busted by the feds, which gets him on Lalo's good side, Jimmy's elevator scheme to get Suzanne Erickson to work with him, and Mike yelling at his 10 year old granddaughter for being shit at her times tables. Jimmy also comes face to face with Nacho after not having seen him since early season 1, and we find out how Crazy 8 got his nickname, which is intriguing. Jimmy and Kim visit an open house which would have been the perfect chance for a Marie cameo, but alas, we do not get that. Gus gets to show just how big of an arsehole he can be by threatening to murder Nacho's father if he doesn't do what he demands. I'm not a huge fan of Mike's moody drunk loser arc in the first half of his season, but it was probably necessary after we did at the end of season 4. And who doesn't love seeing Mike yell at children? Number 96. Madrigal. This episode continues dealing with the fallout of season 4's ending, with Madrigal being investigated for its connections to Poyos and Gus. Peter Schuler finds out about this, and decides he'd rather end it all on the toilet than face the consequences. We are introduced to Lydia, who's anxious about Mike's 11 guys who could pose a threat to them. She tries to subtly suggest offing them, but Mike isn't keen on the idea, since he has something of a moral compass. Speaking of Mike, he's basically the main character of this episode, with his plotline taking up the majority of the runtime and Walt slash Jesse being relegated to a couple scenes. Jesse's all paranoid that the rice and Siggy he supposedly lost is going to turn up somewhere, so Walt, being the nice guy that he is, goes over to his house to help look for it. When they do apparently find it, Jesse cries like a baby about how he was almost going to kill Mr. White over a simple misunderstanding, and Walt uses this opportunity to float the idea of getting back to business. 
They approach Mike with their plan, but he isn't interested, since he knows Walt's just a recipe for disaster. They decide to get going without him though, and while brainstorming potential lab locations with Sol, he suggests that maybe they should move on and get real jobs. Walt's too Sigma to entertain the idea though, since he's a broke bitch. Mike's called into the DEA office for a sit down with Hank and Gomi, where they taunt him over finding Kaylee's nest egg, although he manages to avoid saying anything incriminating. A suspicious call from Chow leads Mike to discover one of his former colleagues killed him and is being paid by Lydia. So he decides to pay her a visit at her extravagant house and is about to cap her, but stops when he realizes he needs a new source of income. Number 95 Bullet Points this episode, like other early season episodes, is all about laying the groundwork for plot lines to come. Walt's still ultra paranoid that Gus is going to stuff him out at any moment, and his fear isn't helped by Hank coming dangerously close to connecting the dots of Gale and the Walt Whitman book. Thankfully, Hank is an idiot and doesn't see the truth literally spelled out for him. Walt goes to Jesse's party to make him feel bad about it, and then he goes to Saul to complain about how shitty his life is, and Saul brings up Ed the Disappearer for the first time, but Walt isn't quite desperate enough to need him yet. Meanwhile, Skylar is trying to prepare Walt so they can tell Hank and Marie about his supposed gambling addiction, and this scene where they're going over Skylar's script is just hilarious, with so many good lines. Up where we left off. I'm, I'm weak, I'm out of control, I mean this whole thing makes me look like crap. This has some... to be a warts and all story, Walt. That's how we'll sell it, and we both look bad. Oh, well, I, how do you look bad exactly? Where is the I slept with my boss bullet point? I can't seem to find that anywhere. Really touch on the fear and despair. It's good to remind them and to get their sympathy right off the bat. We want them to understand why you could do something so stupid. Now, you might look down at the floor with remorse. Hmm? What? You don't have to mean it. You just stare down at your feet, Walt, okay? Then uh, I'm gonna... Maybe I'll tear up a little. You're gonna cry? On cue? I said, I don't know, maybe. When you dab your eyes, you're gonna do it with your right hand or your it's left hand? It's just an idea. One tear, two tears, how many? This has to be convincing. I especially love how peeved Walt gets when Skylar makes it seem like he's supposed to be regretful about what he's done, and he drops the old reliable, providing for the family line that he likes so much. And why, and why am I so ashamed? Do I really need to answer that? I was, and am providing for our family. When they do end up telling the rest of the family about it, they seem pretty impressed. Mike is fed up with Jesse's party hard lifestyle, so he complains about Gus about it and then takes him for a drive so they can bond with each other. There's also this awesome scene where Jesse impresses a chick with his sonic racing skills. Number 94, Wine and Roses. Now this is how you start a season. The cold open of this episode is hands down my favorite in the whole show. The very first shot with the grey ties making us think it's more jean shenanigans until other colours start floating in is just one example of how amazingly the show is filmed. We finally get to see where Saul was living during Breaking Bad, and of course it's the most cartoonishly over the top mansion you could possibly think of, complete with golden toilet, which may or may not be the sex toilet. What really ties the scene together is the music, which somehow perfectly captures that feeling of this being the beginning of the end. As for the rest of the episode, this is the start of a three-part Nacho saga, while Jimmy and Kim shenanigans take a bit of a back seat, which I think was a smart move, because after the end of season 5, I was most looking forward to how Nacho and Lalo's plots would go down, much more than Jimmy and Kim's trolling of Howard. Lalo shows just how prepared he is for any situation, by having this guy around just to kill and use as a body double on the off chance he ever has to fake his death. Funnily enough, this does end up being beneficial to Gus in the end, since Hector can't prove that Lalo was alive since he faked his death so well. The cousins show up to do nothing as usual. Kim is eager to get a move on with the Howard plot, but Jimmy is apprehensive. Unfortunately, his horniness gets a better of him, and he goes to Kevin's country club to make a scene about how Kevin is a Nazi, which he probably is. And we get to see Saul's ass, which is a big bonus. And lastly, Lalo calls up Hector for some advice, who says he needs to find proof. First time watching, I was sure the proof would be Nacho, but unfortunately those two would never come face to face again. Bit of a missed opportunity in my opinion, but whatever. It wouldn't really fit the story about trying to tell anyway. Number 93. Breathe. The obvious highlight of this episode is the ending, where Gus murders Arturo with a plastic bag and makes Nacho watch, and then drops the hardest line in Gus Fring history. From now on, you are... Mine. I've said before that I'm not the biggest fan of Gus in the show, but this is probably his best scene. Kim yelling at Howard is also a great scene. Howard really just can't catch a break during the entirety of the show. Mike meets up with Lydia at this very cinematic location, and I like their back and forth about Mike's security consultant shenanigans. 
Any scene that has Lydia in it is already top tier anyway. The other highlight here is Jimmy's job interview at the copier place. When it seems like they're going to pass him up, he goes back in and makes this great speech about how good he is at selling copiers, but then they decide to hire him on the spot, he suddenly changes his mind and calls him Beta Cox. Jimmy's character is definitely in its most complex this season, I think that's a big part of why it's so good, even if some people think it's boring compared to the other seasons. Number 92. Magic Man. While I have given the first half of season 5 a lot of shit in the past, I do think the first episode is a great starting point for the season. We finally get to see what we've been waiting for since the show started, which is Jimmy in full-on Saul Goodman mode, doing what he does best. The best scene here is when he and the camera crew ambush Bill Oakley to very subtly advertise for Saul. Kim works with another idiot client who's too busy playing Super Mario Land 2 on his Game Boy to pay attention to the deal she's managed to get him, and when Jimmy proposes some chicanery to get him to take the deal, she isn't impressed. She ends up doing it anyway, which plants the seeds for her further descent into slipping Kimmy this season. Meanwhile, Mike's in a bad mood after murdering Verna, and takes it out on Kai for some reason. Lalo's still on the hunt for Verna Ziegler, and is clearly not impressed by Gus's cover story of building a chicken chiller instead of a mother of all meth labs. This episode also has the best gene opening of a show by far, with him being harassed by Jeff and trying to run away, before deciding to deal with it himself instead. This is also the last scene with Robert Forster aka the vacuum guy, since he died one second after filming. Number 91, Amarillo. This episode is when the cracks begin to form in both Jimmy's job at Davis and Maine and his relationship with Kim. Jimmy films an advert for Davis and Maine and airs it without Cliff's permission, which of course blows up in his face despite it working and hides a chicanery from Kim. Stacy thinks she hears gunshots at night so Mike stays up all night to find out whoever's doing it and there's nothing. Even still, Stacy is adamant that there were gunshots so Mike decides to move her out of the neighborhood. Some have said Stacy is taking advantage of Mike and these scenes, but I never saw it that way. She was probably just paranoid from Maddie's death. So now Mike needs more money to pay for a new house, so Caldera hooks him up with Nacho for a Tuco side plot. Jimmy wears a big hat and looks dapper. Number 90. I see you. This is kind of like a half bottle episode, just two episodes before the real bottle episode. After Hank's grisly encounter with the twins, the family sits around the hospital for the whole episode complaining about how crappy everything is. Walt and Jesse are set to officially start cooking in the super lab after a hilarious scene where Gail gets fired. What's up, partner? I can't believe this. Is this is my replacement. Oh, Jesus! When Jesse gives Walt the news about what happened to Hank, Marie obviously blames the DEA guys for taking Hank's gun right before he was ambushed, and then starts blaming Walt as well since he supposedly bought weed from Jesse, which is just stupid. Gus gets a call from Balsa, who's onto him and plans to get the truth from a twin who's still alive. Gus deals with it by sending some poyos over to the hospital to distract everyone, while Mike gives the guy a lethal injection, much to the satisfaction of everyone else. Vernon Howe, you piece of shit. Balsa calls Gus again to complain about the Federales harassing him, and ends up getting killed by them while Gus listens. Meanwhile, Jesse's bored of the lab waiting for Walt to get back, so they can get to work and meet their 200 pounds a week quota, and gets caught acting goofy by Victor. Number 89. Something Stupid. This episode has the most iconic montage of the show, with the split screen and that amazing song in the background, which is so good I never skip it when it shows up in my Spotify playlist. A big time skip like this was pretty much necessary to get to where things are by the end of the season, and they could not have done it in a better way, by both showing the length of time and how Jimmy and Kim are becoming more distant. The time skip also allows us to get into some more fun stuff, like Hector's journey back to being a c**t. This scene where Jimmy kinda embarrasses Kim at the SNC party is funny as hell, and Huel clocking this guy with a sandwich bag sets up the greatest subplot of all time. Kim and Jimmy butt heads again over how to handle things, with Jimmy wanting to do his usual chicanery, and Kim wanting to play it straight, at least until Suzanne Erickson offends her. Gus realises that he can use his veto power to troll Hector forever, and I'm still not entirely clear on how Gus has the power to make these decisions, without the Salamancas getting a say. We get to see the super lab starting to take shape, although it never gets much further than this state for a long time. I do find it a bit weird that so much of the season is dedicated to building the super lab, and we never get to see the fruits of their labour in this show at least, but I guess it didn't really matter at the end. Number 88. Sunk Costs. Jimmy goes to jail after his epic fail in the previous episode, and says to Chuck probably the coldest thing he's ever said in either show. One day you're gonna get sick. Again. Hook you up to those machines that beep and whir and, and you will... die there. Alone. 
This episode is one of the funniest montages in the whole show, of Kim's morning routine. They were clearly going for an Edgar Wright-esque quick cuts type thing, and combined with the awesome song they used, makes this a standout in a show full of cool montages. This is sadly the last chronological appearance of Ernesto, not counting the flashback and winner. I'm still mad that he didn't show up to shit on Howard's grave in season 6. Mike's continued trolling of Hector, now with Gus's approval, is all well and good, but Jimmy's storyline at this point in the show is so good that it kinda overshadows Mike's plot for pretty much all of this season. Which is a shame, because I do like seeing the early stages of Mike and Gus's relationship, even if it does feel like the writers weren't entirely sure how to get from point A to point B. And of course the last scene of this episode with Jimmy and Kim discussing their plan to fight against Chuck, set against that amazing backdrop of the glass block windows, is probably one of the best visuals of the show. I think the most memorable um, experience of Saul for me was, was doing, um, well, they're all so memorable and my favorite, but episode 303, Sunk Costs, the one where um, Bill and Jimmy are on the, on the, the bench in the courthouse and he has the, uh, the burger and the fries to entice Bill. And the reason that it shines a little brighter for me than the other episodes is that, uh, well, Bob and I had had the opportunity to rehearse he invited me to the uh, to the studio to rehearse the scene, and I couldn't because I had I had my daughter with me. So he actually rode his bike over to my house, and we rehearsed it while I was uh, wearing <laughs> my infant daughter in a you know an ergo baby carrier. But because we had had the opportunity to rehearse it so much, by the time we got to filming, we were so comfortable with it that we could find uh, new things, we could explore new avenues. But and we had the the pace down, we had the rhythms down, we had the the words were were there. And uh, they initially wanted to do a whole bunch of different camera setups, but because we had the scene down so well, they were able to just set up a camera. And I think the first two minutes of of that scene with us is just one shot. It's just one camera, no 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 cuts. Number eighty seven, Mass. This episode is all about getting Walt back into cooking again, with Gus pulling his ultimate chip to convince Walt, questioning his masculinity. After introducing him to the super lab, Walt still won't commit to cooking again since his family life is rapidly deteriorating as a result of it, but when Gus asks him why he cooked in the first place, Walt says it was for his family. Gus gives Walt the ultimate alpha male speech about how a man provides for his family, and since Walt is a delusional idiot, this is enough to finally get him back in the saddle. Before this, there's also this hilarious scene where Walt berates Gus for pretending to accept Jesse's supposedly inferior product just to get Walt to cook again, acting like his ego wasn't hurt at all by it. That you believe I have some proprietary kind of selfishness about my own formula. Some sort of overweening pride, I suppose. That you think simply overwhelms me. Clouds my judgment. But it doesn't. Absolutely not. Walt meets with Saul and Jesse to triumphantly mock him with his $3 million deal with Gus, and Saul being the money-grabbing loser that he is, immediately ditches Jesse to get a ride on Walt's dick. Jesse retaliates by smashing Walt's windscreen for the 16th time. Meanwhile, Hank's deep into his RV investigation, trying to find the one that the gas station chick told him about in the previous episode, and embarrassing himself in the process. He manages to eventually track down the RV that Jesse bought slash stole, which we see in the cold open. He also continues his show-long arc of being a to Marie, because he's too manly to talk about his feelings. Walt finally relents in the divorce feud with Skylar, but now that she's seen the money, she's too greedy to sign the papers herself, even though she's still rooting Ted on the regular and enjoying his heated flaws. Number 86. Bingo. This episode is the Kettleman swan song until their triumphant return in season 6, and boy do they go out with a bang. Mike does some classic Mike sneaking around shenanigans, and eats a bunch of apples. Jimmy and Mike doing random favours for each other was one of my favourite aspects of the early seasons of the show, so it's a shame that they kinda stopped doing that from season 4 onwards, although it obviously makes sense plot-wise. Jimmy's moral dilemma over doing the right thing versus getting a big stack of cash is put to the test here, and even Mike seems confused by his decision. We also get to see Jimmy doing what he does best, being a bingo announcer for elderly people. Maybe he should have done this as a career instead of a whole lawyer thing from the start. The Kettleman's finally getting their comeuppance is one of the most satisfying moments of a show, although it's not so satisfying for Jimmy, leading to him having a game of rage in the office he can no longer afford. There is no money with which to make a deal. Can we all three just parachute down from cloud cuckoo land? Because we know without question there is money. Number 85, Rabid Dog. 
This episode is basically the hunt for Jesse, who's mysteriously vanished after pouring gasoline all over Walt's living room. Walt gets Saul's crew to try and find him, but it's a fruitless endeavor. It's not until halfway through the episode that we find out what happened, which is that Hank showed up last minute to stop him from burning the house down, and manages to convince him to join the fight against Heisenberg. When Walt gets home and finds out about the gasoline, he tries to get it cleaned out unsuccessfully, so he makes up another one of his extravagant stories about how he spilled gasoline all over himself. Not even Junior buys it though, thinking it was because Walt fainted or something. They all go to a hotel, and Walt tells Skylar the truth about what Jesse's up to, with this line of dialogue basically summing up their entire relationship. He got upset over this... something he thinks I did. I did do it. Skylar's fed up with Walt's chicanery and suggests they kill Jesse, which Walt acts shocked by, as if he's above doing that sort of thing. Back at Hank's place, he makes Jesse tell the story of everything that happened from the start of the show onward, and then comes up with a plan to get Walt to confess his crimes by putting a wire on Jesse and sending him out to talk to him. Gomez is also there, and I'm a bit annoyed that we didn't get to see Hank telling him that Walt is Heisenberg, since it probably would have been a really good scene, but whatever. We also see how Hank has become consumed by his need to tank down Walt, since he doesn't seem to care at all whether Jesse lives or dies. When they go to execute their plan, Jesse sees a suspicious looking guy who he assumes is a hired gun by Walt, so he gets out of there and tells Hank he has a better way to get him. It turns out the guy was just a random and Walt really did just want to talk, but now that he's out of options, he calls up Todd to organise a hit on Jesse. Number 84. Cornered. This is the one with the I am the one who knocks scene, which is a classic example of people taking a cringe Walt moment and turning it into some kind of badass thing. The scene's clearly meant to show how the pressure's getting to Walt so he lashes out at Skylar and rambles about how cool he is, and he even immediately looks ashamed after what he's done, but people are stupid. This is followed by a great scene where Walt officially gets the car watch from Bogdan, with Mr. Eyebrows wanting to take his first dollar with him, but Walt using semantics to keep it, and then immediately using it on the vending machine. There's also this hilarious scene where Walt's pestering Jesse about his field trips with Mike, and he manages to correctly deduce Gus's plan to drive a wedge between him and Jesse, but he acts so cocksure about it that he just comes across as a massive What, is there something about you that I don't know? Are you a former Navy SEAL? Do you have to have your hands registered as lethal weapons? Now register this. All I'm saying, this whole thing, all of this, it's all about me. When Jesse has to leave the lab to go hang out with Mike again, Walt gets mad about it and pays some of the laundry workers to come down and clean the lab for him while he mugs the camera, feeling pretty proud of himself until Tyrus arrives to ship them back off to wherever. Jesse and Mike are scoping out some meth heads, and Jesse uses his street skills to get into their house, and when one of them has a shotgun, he manages to knock him out with a bong, which Gus finds out about and is apparently impressed by. Meanwhile, Skylar's having a midlife crisis over whether she should stay with Walt or not, and tries to let a coin flip decide for her, but ends up just going back home anyway, to find Walt got Jr. a shiny new Dodge Challenger, and because she's such a bitch wife, she makes Walt return it. Number 83. Over. This episode is filled with cringe Walt moments, since Skylar decides to throw a party for him to celebrate his remission. When everyone gets Walt to make a speech, he essentially says he low-key doesn't deserve to be in remission, and then when he's drinking with Hank, he gets jealous of Junior being so impressed with his Tortuga head story, so he tries to get him wasted to punish him, I guess. Then he throws a fit when Hank takes a bottle in front of everyone. <laughs> Walt tries to make it up to everyone by spending the next few days installing a new water heater and fixing all the rotted wood in their house. Skylar and Junior don't seem to appreciate it though. While he's at the hardware store, he notices an up-and-comer meth cook trying to buy supplies, so he gives him some friendly advice. Then he decides to activate epic badass mode and goes outside to intimidate the two guys while cool music plays. As far as epic Heisenberg moments go, I do think this one's pretty good. Meanwhile, Jesse and Jane get into a bit of strife when her dad shows up and she doesn't seem too keen on formally introducing him. She makes it up to him though by drawing him some Rule 34 art. This episode also has another one of those teddy bear cold opens, which I of course hate. Number 82. Quite a ride. Dropping a random Breaking Bad scene in a completely unrelated episode that sets up something that doesn't pay off until two and a half seasons later was definitely unexpected, and it makes this episode stand out among the other early season 4 ones. I always thought that the lawyer Saul refers Francesca to would end up being Howard, but that did not end up happening. This episode is the beginning of a super lab plot, which some say is boring, but I think it's the best plot Mike had in the whole show. I do find it a bit odd that they never showed the lab being finished, but I guess it wasn't really relevant to the plot by that point. Gus is an idiot for showing his face to Verna right out of a gate, and considering how careful Gus is, it's weird that he even showed his face like ever to him. Jimmy's cell phone side biz kicks off, 
and he shows off just how drippy he can be. Kim works her ass off for a boneheaded PD client. I wonder how he's doing these days. Howard cries about how terrible his life is, but Jimmy does not care. Number 81. Off Brand. Jimmy is now suspended from being a lawyer for the next year, so he has to find other ways to earn money to pay rent. He runs around with his crew trying to find a business to film an advert for, until Drama Girl says he should film an ad for himself, which leads to the greatest work of art ever put to film. Jimmy also finally starts using the name Saul Goodman in some capacity, and we get this iconic line. Saul Goodman? Yeah, it's like, Saul Good, man. <laughs> that guy has a lot of energy. Yeah. It's just a name. Meanwhile, Nacho tries to prove to Hector that he's an alpha male, Gus has a date with Lydia, and Chuck goes shopping. The best scene in the episode is probably this one for certain reasons. Number 80. Bug. This is where season 4 finally starts heating up, with Walt and Jesse reaching a literal breaking point while the cartel plot comes to an ultimatum. Walt's still stuck as Hank's chauffeur to and from various Fring-related establishments, with him coming closer and closer to unraveling the truth. Mike and Jesse are doing some routine work of a farm when one of their guys is suddenly sniped, but Gus is on top of it and struts out to show his massive balls. The scene is kinda stupid, but it does make sense since the cartel's just taking pot shots trying to drum up conflict. Ted's in deep shit with the IRS because he's an idiot who refuses to pay his bills, so Skylar comes to the rescue acting as a silly goofball to get them off his back, which works but only temporarily. Jesse visits Gus for a meal and has the perfect opportunity to poison him with ricin, but he doesn't go through with it. He assumes Gus wants for all clear to dispose of Walt and proves his loyalty like a top G, but Gus actually wants him to come to Mexico with him to show the cartel how to make the blue stuff. Jesse gets freaked out and tries to get Walt to coach him for the big exam, but Walt's too stuck up about the ricin plan to pay him much attention. Eventually shit gets heated and they have a brawl for the ages, with Jesse managing to beat the 50 year old guy with cancer. Number 79 fall. This is without a doubt the lowest Jimmy has ever gone, when he uses Irene as a tool to try and force the Sandpiper settlement so he can earn a cool mill off it. The scenes of Jimmy manipulating everyone into hating Irene is just depressing to watch, and there's really no way to justify it at all, he just did it to be an asshole. At least Irene got some new shoes out of it. Meanwhile Kim is under a lot of pressure from work when she decides to bring on Hank from Twin Peaks as a second client, alongside Mesa Verde, which ends up overworking her until she falls asleep at the wheel and- <laughs> There's a great Jimmy and Howard scene where Jimmy confronts Howard about the Sandpiper case, but ends up being called out for being the greedy man-child he really is. Hector has a pissy fit over Gus's drug distribution being better than his, and it looks like Nacho's sugar pills are about to knock him out, but it doesn't work. Nacho gives up and confesses to his daddy about how much of a loser he is, and he gets kicked out. Mike meets Lydia, and the sexual tension is immense. Howard and Chuck's relationship starts falling apart after Chuck's EHS delusions are made public, and Howard tries to get him to retire. Chuck isn't having it though, and decides he would rather take down his own firm than leave it. He failed, but eventually he did end up getting what he wanted. Number 78. Expenses. I'm a big fan of Jimmy filming wacky videos with his film crew, and this episode is one of my favourite scenes with him. After Jimmy agrees to film the advert for these assholes for free, he pays the crew and has no money left for himself. And because she's the best character, Drama Girl offers to give the money back to him because she can tell Jimmy is a broke bitch. This episode also features the return of the actual best character, Daniel Wormold, aka Price, who Nacho uses in his grand plan to get rid of Hector. Mike does some concrete work and hits it off with his chick Anita. Jimmy tries to get his malpractice insurance refunded, and starts crying about how much of a screw-up Chuck is, which ends up indirectly leading to Chuck's death, which Jimmy doesn't acknowledge until the final episode of the entire series. I don't think I need to comment on Odenkirk's acting, because it's obviously amazing, and everyone knows that, unless you're the Emmys, I guess. Number 77. Hero. Right after Jimmy's bushwalking adventure in the previous episode, Betsy convinces Jimmy to not talk about the stolen money he found by bribing him, and of course he accepts because he's Jimmy. After that we get one of my favourite Jimmy scams, where he gets a billboard put up that may or may not resemble HHM's branding. We get the introduction of two thirds of the film crew this episode, who Jimmy uses to film him heroically saving a guy who falls while taking the billboard down, but of course we know that he actually orchestrated it. This scene where Jimmy and Howard argue over the validity of Jimmy's advertising is great, especially the Ham Lindigo Blue trademark. 
I love when Kim calls Jimmy and listens for his entire stupid voicemail before asking him out to see the thing. And lastly, Chuck's mission to get the newspaper from across the street is truly iconic. Number 76. El Camino. This was a hard one to place in my ranking, since it's a whole different beast from the rest of the episodes. It's not even really an episode, but I'm including it anyway. I did talk about El Camino in my previous video, but I don't think I did a very good job articulating my thoughts properly. In that video, I mainly talked about how the movie has no reason to exist, which I still think is true, but taking it for what it is, I do think it's pretty damn good. Obviously, the cinematography, soundtrack, acting, and directing are all top tier and on par with the best Better Call Saul episodes, but the story is just kind of lame and doesn't really do anything too unexpected or interesting. I like all the Breaking Bad characters who show up, including Megamind Walt, and my favorite is probably the last one with Jane. Neil and his cronies are pretty unremarkable characters, but the shootout scene is cool as hell, so it makes up for it. My favorite scene of the movie is definitely when Jesse is searching Todd's apartment, and speaking of Todd, I'm really happy we got to see more of him. His whole adventure with Jesse is like a little self-contained short film. If you look at this movie as a gift for the fans, for them to finally get closure on what ended up happening to Jesse, then I think it's all well and good. It's satisfying to see him drive off at the end without all the baggage he had the last time he drove off. Did it have to exist? No. Am I glad it exists? Yeah. Number 75. Caballo Sin Nombre. This episode continues Walt's meltdown arc that was started this season, featuring classic scenes like him going Heisenberg mode on a random cop and getting pepper sprayed, the scene where Skylar threatens him with a restraining order, I will get a restraining order. Get your restraining order right here! Restrain this! And of course the famous pizza scene, where Walt comes to Skylar with an irresistible offer of a pizza for the family, and even dipping sticks. This whole plotline of Walt just completely falling apart is one of my favourites in the whole show, and it peaks in another episode that we'll get to later. Meanwhile, Jesse enlists Saul in a scheme to get his house back, where he manages to buy it for 400 grand instead of 875 that they were asking for, by bringing up a meth lab that used to be in the basement. This scene is classic Saul shenanigans, and one of my favourites of his. It also leads to this great moment where Jesse shows up as his parents are leaving the house, and he gets to make a display of unlocking the door and dropping a zinger for the ages. The new owners are expected at any moment. Where do you think you're going? Inside. Bought the place. But an even better Saul scene is in this same episode, where he visits Walt to give him a pep talk and make him feel better about Skylar ghosting him. And this is one of like two scenes across the whole show where Saul really feels like James McGill, especially this part afterwards where he gets in his car. I know it wasn't planned at all, but this whole scene just hits so hard after watching Better Call Saul and knowing that Kim's been out of Saul's life for like four years at this point. And after a decent interval of time, well... There are other fish in the sea. You've been out of circulation for a while. I mean, you'll be just amazed at what's out there. Thailand, the Czech Republic. I mean, those women are so grateful to even be here. Walt gets fed up and decides to break into his own house since Skylar changed the locks. While he's in the shower, the twins show up to pay him a visit, but are interrupted last minute by Gus sending his classic Puyo's message, thanks to Mike, who was watching the house. So, yeah, really funny episode. Number 74, Piñata. This episode has the grand return of Chuck, so already it's the best episode of season 4 so far. This is also the last time we see Jimmy, Kim, Chuck and Howard on screen together, back in HHM before things went to shit, and we see the moment Jimmy decides to become a lawyer apparently. Mike and Gus work on setting up for the Germans, and I really like their dynamic here. Mike knows that normal people need entertainment so they don't go crazy, but Gus is a robot who doesn't understand what emotions are, so there's like a fun dynamic going on there. Well, he does have one emotion actually, revenge. As seen later in the episode, where he visits Hector in the hospital to tell him a story about a tree in a Kawati, which obviously parallels his situation with Hector. Some people theorized that this speech was foreshadowing what Gus would end up doing to Lalo, but that turned out to not be the case, mostly. This scene is good for catching up people on how dedicated Gus is to his trolling if they can't remember all the details from Breaking Bad. Jimmy expands his cell phone business and gets revenge on those hooligans who mugged him. The best scene of the episode is when Jimmy goes to collect his five grand check from Howard, who is still sulking around like a baby. Jimmy tries to motivate Howard, and although it seems like he doesn't appreciate the advice, we see in Season 5 that he did end up taking it to heart. Hopefully Season 4 is the last of Howard's troubles. Number 73. Cats in the Bag. 
The second episode of the show keeps up the quick pace of a pilot, with Jesse and Walt deciding to terminate their partnership after they dispose of Emilio and Crazy Eight, only to discover that Domingo is actually still alive. They do a coin flip to decide who should have the pleasure of killing him, and Jesse wins. Walt wants him to dissolve Emilio in hydrofluoric acid, but Jesse can't be bothered trying to find a plastic bin big enough of a body, so he uses the bath instead, showing his resourceful thinking. Walt's too much of a pussy to deal with Crazy Eight, so he just makes him a sandwich instead. Skylar hears Jesse's voicemail on the phone and does some detective work, finding his awesome website. She confronts Walt about it, and he says Jesse's his weed dealer, which Skylar seems pretty appalled by. Walt kinda loses his shit at her about it, but does so in a very nice manner. What I need is for you to climb down out of my ass. Will you do that for me, honey? Will you please, just once, get off my ass? You know. I'd appreciate it. I really would. Skylar pays Jesse a visit to intimidate him Heisenberg style, which works pretty well. Walt goes back to Jesse's place and finds out about his genius bathtub solution, just in time for Emilio's remains to come crashing down through the ceiling. This episode is also the one with a famous not my house line. And we're gonna drive it over to your house. My house? Yes, your house. We're gonna drive it over there and park it overnight, and then tomorrow- Oh uh, man, not my house! Number 72. Negro e Azul Jesse's in a bad mood after witnessing the brutal ATM murder last episode, but after Walt meets up with Badger and Skinny Pete and sees how people are now afraid of Jesse because they think he's the one who did the crushing, he goes back to his place and motivates him by comparing him to a blowfish. The scene is just awesome, and it's always great to see Walt give Jesse a pep talk that doesn't have some sinister manipulation attached. Who messes with the blowfish, Jesse? Nobody. You're damn right. You are a blowfish. Say it again. I'm a blowfish. Say it like you mean it. I'm a blowfish! You're a blowfish! That's yeah! Right. Blowfish in this up. Hank isn't having a fun time at El Paso, with his colleagues being meanie heads to him behind his back. When Tortuga's head shows up on a turtle, they all laugh at Hank for being freaked out by it, but they get their comeuppance when the turtle blows up and annihilates all of them. This just makes Hank even more freaked out though. Jesse and Walt decide that they need more dealers and to start charging more once they corner the market, while Skylar goes to Ted's work to get a job. He basically immediately starts playing the moves, which isn't a good sign of things to come. Jesse shows off his new TV to Jane, which is enough for her to fall for him. This episode also has the weird-ass Heisenberg music video thing at the start, which is intriguing to say the least. Number 71. Crazy Handful of Nothing. This is officially the moment where Walt becomes an epic badass, when he shaves his head and starts blowing up buildings. Walt is unsatisfied with the rate Jesse's selling their product, and wants a distributor who can buy in bulk. Jesse gets Skinny P to introduce him to Tuco, who's impressed by his meth but isn't going to pay for it up front, and beats up Jesse when he tries to take the meth and leave. Meanwhile Walt started his cancer treatment, and when his hair starts falling out he decides to just get rid of all of it, which amuses Skylar and impresses Junior. Walt takes his so-called meth and hustles over to Tuco's hidey hole to get his money back plus some extra for Jesse's pain and suffering. Everyone laughs at him for bringing more meth of them to steal, until Walt literally drops the ultimate one-liner. This is not meth. Yeah, this scene's kinda stupid, but this whole show is honestly kinda stupid, so it's not really a legit issue. Walt succeeds in getting his money plus a budding business relationship with Tuco, and goes psycho mode in his car to celebrate. Meanwhile, Hank does some digging and finds out that the gas mask he found was actually from Walt's school, and it turns out that there's some other chemistry stuff that was also taken. The DEA ends up arresting the random worker guy Hugo, who was a bro to Walt earlier in the episode, but Walt doesn't seem to care. Number 70. Buried. This episode is Walt's mad rush to hide evidence after Hank finds out about him, mainly his $80 million bed in the storage locker. Huel and Kubi arrive to clear it out, but not after doing a little lovemaking on top of it. Walt takes his seven barrels of cash out to where him and Jesse first cook together, and spends the night burying it. Skylar gets ambushed by Hank, who wants her to help him in the fight against Heisenberg, but she isn't interested. Saul proposes sending him on a trip to Belize, but Walt is disgusted at the notion, even though he just killed like 10 people in 2 minutes a few months back. When Walt arrives home from his excavation expedition, he has a little nap on the bathroom floor, and offers to turn himself in for Skylar, but as long as she keeps the money. Skylar isn't an idiot and no that ain't possible, so she decides I should just lie low for a bit. Meanwhile Lydia visits Declan's shitty meth lab to do some quality control, which involves Uncle Jack and his merry crew rocking up and executing everyone, while Todd makes the moves. 
Marie obviously wants Hank to go to the DEA with the news about Walt, but he's rightfully embarrassed that he didn't notice the truth literally staring him in the face for over a year. He decides he won't review anything until he actually takes Walt down, and when the opportunity appears to interrogate Jesse on the matter, who was busy being a nighttime philanthropist, he pays him a visit. Number 69. Peekaboo. This is one of Jesse's best episodes, with him on a mission to get back the money and meth Spooge and his chick stole from Skinny Pete. He psychs himself up with his gun and barges into their house, only to find that they're not there, but their five-year-old son is. So he just kind of hangs out with his kid until the parents get home, and when they do, Jesse shows them who's boss, but the kid gets in the way. Apparently the money is inside this random automatic ATM machine that they stole, so Spooge gets to work trying to open it, while Jesse chastises the lady for being the worst mother in history. While he's trying to drill the thing open, Spooge has a yelling contest with her until she eventually crushes his head with the ATM, because she ain't no skank. Meanwhile, Walt's in hot water when Skylar calls Gretchen about her supposedly paying his medical bills, and she comes over to find out what the hell she's on about. Walt has a one-on-one -on -one meeting with her, where he refuses to tell her what's going on and acts like a baby about how they apparently forced him out of grey matter, and are profiting over his discoveries. The whole grey matter backstory is one of the most interesting aspects of Walt's character for me, with how he left because of his pettiness and still holds so much resentment for it years later, to the point where he goes on diatribes about it to both Jesse and Saul. Anyways, Gretchen says she feels sorry for him, and Walt gives an appropriate response. Fuck you. Number 68 black and blue. It was hard to decide if I like Axe and Grind or this episode more, and I ended up with this one because of two main reasons. Howard and Jimmy's boxing match, which was so bad that it was good, and the return of Lalo after being MIA for four episodes. This episode has some more setup for future conflicts, with Gus planting his gun down at the lab, which made it extremely obvious what was eventually going to happen down there. Francesca makes her return to start working at Saul's new office, and Kim doesn't let Jimmy in on the fact that Lalo was still alive. Lalo being in Germany was an awesome moment because so many people predicted that's where he was, but it just didn't seem fully believable until the moment it actually happened. Him sneaking around Marguerite's house was another really suspenseful moment, because it really felt like someone could get whacked at any second. I can definitely see why Verna was so desperate to see her now. Number 67, 5 0. I rated this episode pretty low last time, but on my last rewatch, I realized I was probably a bit too mean. This is a lot of people's favourite episode from the earlier seasons, and it's easy to see why. We finally get an episode entirely focused on many people's favourite character, and it really is everything you could want. We get to learn about Mike's tragic past, which wasn't really brought up in the original show beyond that awesome scene in Half Measures. Obviously Jonathan Banks' acting in this episode is some of his best work, since it's easily the most varied material he ever got to work with, beyond the more usual rigmarole he's usually doing throughout the show. This is also the episode that formally introduces us to Stacy, who I really like mainly because the actress who plays her, Kerry Condon, is so awesome. Unfortunately, she never really gets much to work with, so her character comes across kind of forgettable, but if you've seen the Banshees of Inner Sharon, you know she's a great actor. My only real problem with this episode, and the reason it's still kind of low, is I will always prefer the Jimmy plot to Mike shenanigans, even when the Mike plot is at its best. I can forgive this one being so Mike-centric though, since the rest of the season is pretty much entirely focused on the Jimmy side of things. And also the episode's called 5-0, and it's not even the fifth episode, 0 out of 10. Number 66, Blood Money. The beginning of the back half of season 5 marks the start of shit rapidly falling apart. Hank has finally figured out the most obvious thing ever, and after having an episode while driving home, goes back through his evidence to do some detective work and confirm his suspicions. Jesse's in an altruistic mood, and visits Saul to give him his $5 million payout that Walt dropped off last episode. He wants half of it to go to Kaylee for Time Traveler, and the other half to go to Drew Sharp's parents. Walt gets wind of this and tries to give the money back to Jesse, but he's wise enough to the fact that Walt definitely killed Mike, even though Walt gets a shitty attempt at trying to deny it. Maybe he shouldn't have made it so fucking obvious in the first place. You get safe? He's gone. Jesse gives up on Kaylee and Drew, and instead just drives around random neighborhoods throwing the money at people's houses. Later, while Walt is vomiting in the loo since his cancer is back, he realizes that the leaves of the grass book he idiotically left on the commode is gone, and after checking his car and finding one of those tracker things that Hank had him use on Gus in Season 4, he heads over to his house to confront him about it. At first they both try to play coy, but eventually Hank just cuts to the chase and sucker punches him. Walt tries to convince Hank to back down since his cancer is back and whatnot, and when it becomes clear that it's a fruitless endeavor, he switches to Heisenberg mode to drop a swaggy one-liner. Maybe your best course would be to tread lightly. 
It's unknown how long the two of them awkwardly stood in the garage before Hank opened the door again. Number 65. Problem Dog. Skylar makes Walt return the car he bought for Junior in the previous episode, but instead he decides to take it for a little joyride in a random parking lot, ending with him blowing it up. Saul deals with the costs of his shenanigans while Walt complains more about his situation with Gus. Walt wants to hire a hitman to deal with Fring, but since everyone in that business knows Mike, he decides the second best option is Jesse. He heads over to his place for another round of obvious manipulation, and then makes him some ricin to poison Gus with. Jesse's immediately presented with several easy opportunities to kill Gus, but doesn't want to do it because he's too much of a nice guy. Skylar is ungrateful when Walt presents with fat stacks of cash to launder. Meanwhile, Hank's deep into his investigation of the chicken man, getting Flynn to drive him over to Poyo's to get his fingerprints, and presenting the evidence to the other DEA guys. They don't seem convinced until Hank shows them Gus's prints were at Gail's apartment. Jesse goes to the support meeting and not so subtly goes on a spiel about how he killed Gail aka the problem dog, and when he gets judged for it he calls out the whole acceptance thing as being a load of crap, and reveals why he's actually there in the first place. It's to sell your meth! You're nothing to me but customers! This scene is just great, and probably some of Aaron Paul's best acting in the show. Number 64. Hermanos. This episode focuses heavily on Gus, finally giving us the big missing pieces of his character, mainly concerning his past. First the DEA has him come over for a grilling on why his prints were at Gail's apartment, with Gus managing to spin up some story about how Gail wanted money. And when Hank says there's no records of Gus living in Chile, he just tells him to look harder. Hank isn't impressed and gets Walt to drive him to Poyos for some detective work, and makes Walt stick a tracker thing on Gus's car. Hank is an idiot as usual and doesn't think anything of Walt's desperate attempts to get out of the situation. He rushes over to Jesse's place to tell him they need to accelerate their Gus murder plan, but Jesse isn't interested since he's in with the cool kids now. Gus has a meeting with Mike over whether Hank is an issue, and then drives over to Casa Tranquila to troll Hector for a bit. I know we take it for granted now, but the decision to have Hector, this random wheelchair guy from season 2, become an integral part of Gus's backstory is genius. And it's revealed in this scene why they got beef with each other, when Gus and his boyfriend Max tried to pitch their meth business to Don Eladio, and while Max is babbling on about how cool Gus is, he gets capped by Hector. This scene, and the rest of the episode, instantly shifts Gus's character from a cool bad guy to a way more complex character, and lays the seeds for his epic revenge just a few episodes later. The writers try to add more to Gus's backstory in Better Call Saul, but I think what we got in this show was the right amount for Gus. I think it's best for rest is left unexplained, since it doesn't really matter anyway. What I'm trying to say is we definitely do not need a Gus prequel show or movie or whatever. Number 63. Nacho. This episode is where the show really gets going. In the first episode, Kim had two lines of dialogue, and in the second episode she had like one shot of her, which is really weird looking back, but in this episode we get our proper introduction to her and Jimmy's relationship, which is pretty much summed up perfectly in this first scene where he calls her at 2am, and she immediately assumes he wants to do phone sex. We also get to see Jimmy and Mike's dynamic start to develop, when Mike gives him some advice on how to find the missing Kettleman's. Nacho is super intimidating here, which is kind of weird to see after seeing how his story unfolds throughout the rest of the show. After this plotline, he and Jimmy don't even interact again until Season 5. Jimmy's attempt to anonymously warn the Kettlemans about Nacho is hilarious, especially when he just gives up his funny voice and just shouts into the phone instead. This episode as a whole is just really amusing, like when Jimmy tells Kim about his warning later on, and she straight away deduces that he used for sex robot voice. I called the Kettlemans anonymously to warn them. Anonymously? You did- Oh god, you didn't- You didn't do the sex robot voice, did you? I did. The tube and the whole thing, which- which I don't even want to know how that comes up in their relationship normally. The cold open introduces us to the hilariously bad young Jimmy wig, which I will still take any day over CGI de-aging or any of that shit. We get our first mention of the Chicago sunroof, which obviously comes back in a big way in the season finale. Capping off the episode is a sublime montage of Jimmy adventuring out into the woods to find the Kettlemans, with a very fitting song to accompany it. Song choices for montages is something that the show never fails to impress on. Number 62, Fifi. This episode is one of the coolest cold opens of the series, showing border security searching trucks for drugs and whatnot. It's mostly filmed in one long take, and the music is some of Dave Porter's best work. The rest of the episode is kind of like a battle for Mesa Verde between Wexler McGill and HHM. When Kim gives her resignation to Howard, he seems pretty proud of her and expresses some level of regret for not doing his own thing instead of letting his dad convince him to jump on the HHM train. I really love these moments of characters putting aside their beef with each other to be genuine for a moment, 
and it reminds me of a similar scene in season 1 when Jimmy and Howard sort of reconcile after Chuck's peak-headedness is revealed. Obviously this moment of wholesomeness is cut short when Kim leaves Howard's office and overhears him already making a move on Mesa Verde. She manages to secure them for her own practice, but Chuck has to ruin it by getting them back on Team HHM by saying Kim isn't experienced enough. When Jimmy gets wind of this, he goes ahead and does perhaps his smartest scheme ever, swapping the address of a planned Mesa Verde branch from 1261 to 1216, which of course sets in motion all the conflicts for Season 3. This show does such a good job at making pretty mundane work look super exciting, and this is no exception. Mike doesn't do much of importance this episode, but watching Mike do nothing is still a great TV experience. Jimbo also shoots another wacky commercial with his crew, this time with a guy Jimmy once defended for public masturbation. It really seems like Albuquerque has a problem with that. Number 61. Confessions. This is the episode where things officially go from bad to worse for everyone. Hank tries to get Jesse to help him with the Walt problem, but he still has too much of a hate boner for Hank to do anything. Marie tries to lure Junior over to the Schrader joint, but Walt guilts him into staying by revealing his cancer has returned. Walt and Skylar get sick of Hank being a nosy bitch, so they make a little video and give it to him during his very awkward meetup. Back at home, Hank and Marie watch Walt's confession and realize that Hank was actually the villain all along. But instead of turning himself in, he decides to double down. Walt and Jesse meet up in the desert for a little chat while Saul awkwardly stands there, where Walt not so subtly tries to get him to leave town. Jesse finally hits back at him for being a manipulative but breaks down like a baby when Walt gives him a hug. Jesse prepares for his new life in Alaska, complete with a touching goodbye from Saul, until at the last second he realizes Walt poisoned Brock, and uh, I have some problems with this. I'm sorry, but I just don't believe that Jesse in his current state would be able to make that leap from Huel pocketing his weed to the cigarette thing from ages ago. And the whole poisoning plot point is kind of vague in the first place, but I'll talk more about that later. It's not too bad though, since it does lead to this killer scene where Jesse goes psycho mode on Saul with some insane line deliveries from Aaron Paul. You had him still off of me and all for that asshole Mr. White! He poisoned Brock! He poisoned Brock and you, you helped him! Then he drives over to Walt's house to do some remodeling with one of the funniest cliffhangers. <laughs> Number 60. Breaking Bad Better Call Saul having an episode called Breaking Bad is a prediction that I think everyone had, but didn't think would actually happen, and yet it did. And while this episode isn't the full-length Breaking Bad episode we were all hoping for, it does use the scenes from that era to parallel Gene and Jeff's wacky adventures, where they themselves become the breakers of bad. Obviously the fact that this episode has Walt and Jesse in it is enough to catapult it into everyone's top 10, but for me it was low-key the worst scene of the episode. It does flesh out Saul's involvement in the early days of the meth trade, but it kind of felt like the writers decided they wanted a Walt and Jesse scene first, and then wrote a scene around that, as opposed to the other way around. On the opposite end, the Mike scene is great, since his and Saul's dynamic is something I wish we got more of in Breaking Bad, and I still wish we got more of it in general. And it obviously shows how Saul was unable to resist the urge to make a shit ton of money, leading to him making the biggest mistake of his life when he goes to Walt's school. The intercutting between that scene and Gene breaking into Cancer Guy's house was very keen though. Seeing the cold open of this episode for the first time was one of the most hype moments of the whole show, and for the most part, Brian Cranston and Aaron Paul did a very good job at playing their characters again. More so Cranston than Paul in this episode, but I think Aaron did a way better job in the Jesse scene next episode. It was also pretty surreal to find out what happened to a lot of random characters after Breaking Bad, like getting confirmation that Skylar got a deal, Huel got out of a safe house and went back home, Price is probably in jail, and Kubi is who knows where. Number 59 a, B, Q. The finale of season 2 is a whole bunch of awesomeness and one big blemish, which I think is pretty obvious what it is. This is where the stupid cold opens from across season 2 finally pay off, and it's not really worth it honestly. I do like the idea of Walt being half responsible for the deaths of loads of people, kind of like a bigger stupider version of Howard's death being caused by Jimmy and Kim, but it ends up just being played off almost as a joke in the end. But other than that, everything else here is really good with Jesse waking up to the unpleasant sight of Jane's rotting corpse, leading to Mike coming into the show for the first time to clean up the place and give Jesse a pep talk. Meanwhile, Skylar and Walt Jr. are all excited about the cash coming in through the Save Walter White website, but Walt is less than infused. Donald goes over to Jane's house to get a rehab journey started, only to find that it's already over. Walt takes Jesse to rehab, and then heads over to the hospital for some surgery, and while he's all drugged up, he lets it slip that he in fact does have a second cell phone, confirming Skylar's suspicions throughout the season. Afterwards, Skylar is eager to kick his ass out, and the scene where she finally exposes him is just so satisfying. 
I'm glad they got this reveal out of the way relatively early in the show, since Skylar's character becomes way more interesting once she has the knowledge of Walt's activities. During this whole scene, Walt's rocking this iconic pink jumper as well. He sits by the pool thinking about how much of a fuck up he is, when suddenly the sequel to 9-11 happens above him. Number 58. Miho. The second episode of the show kicks things into high gear straight away, with Jimmy thrown into the desert to negotiate with the least negotiable person in Albuquerque. This scene takes up like half the episode and goes to show just how good at his job Jimmy can be, and that he actually has a moral compass, since he didn't leave the skateboard kids to get turned into meat pinatas by Tuco. We also get to meet Nacho, who at this stage is a far cry from what he becomes later down the road. We also get some more insight into Chuck's peculiar disease, when he has to wrap himself in a space blanket when he thinks Jimmy is up to his usual hijinks. We are also introduced to the first of many montages in the show, showing Jimmy doing his shitty PD work and his back and forth with Mike with stickers, and we see Kim for a whopping two shots in the entire episode. Number 57, Inflatable. This episode is possibly the most important flashback for Jimmy's character, where a random guy taking advantage of his dad's generosity gives young Jimmy some advice. This pretty much leads to all the bad things Jimmy ever does after this, so bravo to this one guy for ruining everything for everyone, ever. But the real star of this episode is everything to do with Jimmy's storyline, where he finally decides to quit his job at Davis and Maine, until he finds out he won't get to keep a bonus in his contract unless he is fired. And so we get another one of the best montages in the show. I feel like I say that about every montage, they're all so good. Jimmy's antics to get himself fired are of course hilarious, and Cliff's last words to him are the icing on the cake. For what it's worth, I think you're a good guy. For what it's worth, I think you're an asshole. He even gets to keep the Coco Bolo desk, so everything works out in the end. And then we get Jimmy's passionate speech to Kim about starting a law firm together so they can be their own bosses. And while she does turn him down, she comes back with an even better offer at the end of the episode. And this scene of Jimmy sending his new voicemail message is also great. And we get a cameo from a film crew, so of course this episode is a 10 out of 10. Number 56. Hazard Pay. This episode officially marks the start of one of my favourite plot lines, the trio of Walt, Jesse and Mike going into business together, plus Saul for added chicanery. They all meet up at the Cathedral of Justice to set the terms, with Mike handling the business end while Walt and Jesse cook the goods. Walt doesn't seem entirely happy with the arrangement. They then go on a tour of potential lab locations, including Price's laser base, and eventually Walt pitches the idea of using Vamino's pest to cook inside people's houses. I really dig this scene where Badger and Skinny Pete go to buy the roadie cases for the equipment, where we see Petey's insane piano skills while Badger's just annoying in the background. Walt and Jesse get the mobile lab set up and get to work, segueing into my absolute favourite cooking montage in the whole show, set to this exquisite song by The Peddlers. The visuals during this sequence get pretty funky, and the music just goes so well with it. This whole episode kind of feels like the calm before the storm, where Walt is at his peak before everything starts falling apart. Him and Jesse are on good terms, he's making mad stacks, and everything's under control. Reality starts to set in a bit though when it comes time to receive their earnings. This scene is just so funny, with the money piles rapidly shrinking as the reality of running a business sets in. The dynamic between Walt and Mike is probably my favourite of any two characters, since they both just despise each other so plainly, and it's a big part of why I love the first half of season 5 so much. And when Jesse gets sick of their back and forth and just offers to take the money out of his share, that's enough for Walt to back off since he's far too cool to accept charity. Meanwhile Skylar's down in the dumps with Walt moving back in, and when Marie acts annoying as usual, she decides to give her what she deserves. I'm sorry, please don't speak to me like that. I am simply saying that you Will you shut up? You hey. Shut the hell up. Shut up. Shut up. Skylar. Shut up. Please shut up. Stop. I shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut hey. up. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Number 55. Smoke. Chuck is dead, and this episode is dedicated to dealing with that, as well as the rest of the season. Chuck's house looks pretty epic when it's burnt to a crisp, and his funeral is pretty lame as expected. This is one of the most depressing episodes for Howard outside of, you know, where he confesses to Jimmy and Kim that Chuck's death is all of his fault, or at least that's what he thinks. Jimmy's response might be one of his darkest moments, and really sets the stage for his storyline this season. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum, we have wacky Mike security consultant shenanigans. Equally good in its own way of course, but definitely makes the overall tone of the episode a bit wacky. Meanwhile Nacho is in hot water after his sugar pills take out Hector, but Gus is onto him, beginning the endless cycle of Nacho taking L after L until his eventual end. Number 54. Switch. This episode is so important for Jimmy and Kim's relationship, 
It's the one that introduces us to Kim's alter ego Slip and Kimmy, and how her and Jimmy bond over scamming people. Always good to see Ken wins take an L. This episode really shows that Kim and Jimmy are perfect for each other, considering they made up their scam on the fly and it works perfectly. Of course the real star of the show is Price, now driving a school bus for 6 year old pimps, but Mike doesn't approve. The ending of the episode is especially great, where it looks like Jimmy has gotten everything he could possibly want, including the Coco Bolo desk, until we see the switch that says not to be flipped. Jimmy flips it anyway because of course he does, implying his career at Davis and Maine might not go as smoothly as expected. Number 53. Green Light. This episode is the apex of Walt's meltdown arc, and it's honestly the funniest episode of the whole show. So many hilarious moments to be found here, starting with Walt trying to break into Ted's office to have a talk with him, which goes about as well as expected. Open the door! Come on, let's talk. I just want to talk, that's all. Come on, let's be men about this, huh? Okay? How about that? We have a situation oh. in this. Walt. 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 What are you doing? I'm talking with Ted. Next time, you'll open the door! There he is. Come on. Followed by Saul staging an intervention for him, which is cut short when Walt realizes that Saul had Mike bug his house, which causes the two of them to have a little tussle, while Mike acts as their marriage counselor. Then Walt has Mike take the bugs out of his house, with some delicious hypocrisy to boot. Great line of work, by the way. Real upstanding field. Yeah, well, I enjoy it. And it gets even better still, with this scene where Carmen tries to have a talk with him in her office, and he tries to play the moves on her, which doesn't seem to end well. He's placed on indefinite leave, aka unemployment, and meets up with Jesse while taking his stuff to his car. Yo, did he just get fired? No. No, no, no. More like a sabbatical? Indefinite. Walt isn't pleased to find out that Jesse's been cooking the product without him, and gets all high and mighty about how it's his formula and so on. He acts like Jesse's cook is crap compared to his, even though it's probably like exactly the same. There's also this scene where Mike updates Gus on Walt's downward spiral, and when he suggests letting him know that there's two Terminators on the hunt for him, Gus quotes Mike from four years prior. If you want this guy to produce again, why not just tell him? You're the only thing that stands between him and an axe in the head. I don't believe fear to be an effective motivator. I want investment. You want to keep Varga in for the long run? I don't think fear is a great motivator. They decide to accept Jesse's meth in order to get Walt pissed off and back into cooking, which ends up working exactly as planned in the next episode. Meanwhile, Hank is in a foul mood because he has to go back to El Paso, but when he finds out that Blue Meth is back on the street, he immediately abandons it and rushes off to question some guy, and eventually finds this chick who Jesse gave meth to at the start of the episode. He uses his charm to find out that she got it from a guy who drives an RV. This episode is the chief example of a show being a really good comedy, and it's a big part of why season 3 is one of my favourites. Number 52. Nailed. This episode is the fallout of Jimmy's address swapping of 1261 to 1216 from the previous episode, which sees Chuck getting riled up in court at the prospect of being wrong about something, which leads to Mesa Verde's expansion plans being delayed by six weeks. Of course he immediately knows it's Jimmy who was behind the chicanery, and lays out a practically beat for beat accurate guess of what happened to Kim. Kim does side with Jimmy, but it turns out that she knew it was him all along. Chuck decides to do some detective work, but Jimmy pays off the copy shop guy not to rat him out. Chuck cries like a baby then hits his head and dies. On the Mike side of the story, he continues his trolling of Hector, which leads to a good Samaritan being murdered by Salamanca goons. Which obviously goes against Mike's code of conduct when it comes to random people becoming collateral damage from people in the game. Jimmy and Kim move into and start working at their new Wexler McGill office, which was always my favourite of all of Jimmy's workplaces throughout the show. There's some pretty iconic shots in this episode, and of course the best part is Jimmy singing the Pina Colada song. If you like Pina Coladas, getting caught in the rain. If you're not into yoga, and you got half a brain. Number 51. Click. The finale of season 2 is equally exciting from both the Mike and Jimmy sides of the story, with Mike setting out to get rid of Hector once and for all, which culminates in a scene that's super tense even though we obviously know both Mike and Hector are in Breaking Bad. 
The reveal of the note on Mike's car was a super exciting moment the first time watching, since it was basically confirmation that Gus was getting in on the action, which some people had already figured out based on rearranging the first letters in each of season 2's episode titles. Meanwhile, Jimmy has to deal with Chuck's death at the end of the previous episode, and although Chuck immediately sees through him, Ernesto comes in clutch to save Jimmy. No one in this entire show ever appreciates Ernesto, which is a real shame. We also get a pretty depressing, although very important, cold open, where Jimmy and Chuck's mother dies while cucking Chuck one final time. The highlight of this episode is of course the ending, when Jimmy confesses to Chuck that he did indeed swap the addresses exactly like how Chuck accused him. Bob Odenkirk's acting here is amazing. She worked her butt off to get Mesa Verde while you and Howard sat around sipping scotch and chortling. Hamlin, Hamlin, McGill, more like Scrooge and Marley. I honestly didn't think it would hurt you so bad. I thought you'd just say, oh crap, I made a mistake and go on with your life like a normal person, but oh no! WISHFUL THINKING! The reveal that Chuck played Jimmy like a fiddle is the best cliffhanger of the show possibly, and really pushes Chuck into the full on villain role that he has in the first half of season 3. Number 50. Alpine Shepherd Boy. I've talked about this episode on two separate occasions in both my original ranking and a whole video dedicated to it. For those of you who are unaware, this is the episode with the sex toilet. The sex toilet scene is hands down the best scene of the entire series, maybe in all of TV history. Dumb people like to call this the worst episode of the show for some reason, which I find bizarre because not only does it have the sex toilet and the guy who prints his own currency, but there's also the major reveal slash confirmation that Chuck's EHS is all in his mind. Still don't know why we needed a theory video for something that was confirmed in the fifth episode, but whatever. Jimmy begins his foray into Elder Law by donning a white suit and advertising at the bottom of Jello cups. All that plus a healthy dose of foreshadowing makes this one of the more memorable season one episodes. Coleman lanterns indoors, a camp stove. He could burn his house down or the entire neighborhood. And then you're looking at a commitment of 10 to 20 years. Number 49, one minute. This is basically Hank's episode in the spotlight, with him losing his shit and gamer raging at Jesse after he got trolled last episode, even though it was actually Walt who did it. So now Jesse's in the hospital, and Hank's in the shitter, with Jesse telling Walt he's gonna ruin that bald c**t's career, while Saul takes funny photos. Hank realizes he has a moral compass, and comes clean about his altercation, and the DEA is left with no choice but to suspend him and take his gun. Walt comes back to Jesse with an offer he couldn't possibly refuse, to cook in the super lab with him for half of his free meal. Jesse rightfully turns him down because Walt's an arsehole who ruined his entire life, but then when Walt says his meth is in fact not garbage, and actually as good as his own, that's enough for him to change his mind. This is probably the best scene of the episode. Aaron Paul is just so good at playing a crybaby. Now that he has Jesse on board, Walt calls up Gus to get rid of that pedo Gale and get Jesse on board, which he thankfully accepts. Hank is out buying shit for Marie, and when he gets in his car, he receives a call from Gus, using the Ghostface voice filter to warn him about the twins who are currently approaching him. Because they're the most incompetent hitmen alive, Hank manages to easily dispatch of one of them, and almost gets murked by the other, but he decides he'd rather get shot in the face than finish the job in a timely manner. That last scene makes this episode an instant classic, and the rest of it ain't half bad either. Still think the twins are lame though. Number 48. Mandela. This episode kicks season 2 into ultra high gear, with the introduction of Gus, the murder of Combo, pregnancy shenanigans, and more. Jesse calls up Walt to give him the news that Combo was shot by some kid, but Walt is too much of a bonehead to even remember who he is. They go to Saul's office for some marriage counselling, and when he finds out how much meth they have on hand, he tells them he knows a guy who knows a guy who knows another guy who can put them in touch with a mysterious businessman with big plans. Walt and Jesse go to the top secret meeting place, but Jesse is high from his fun times with Jane and leaves in a hurry. When Walt complains to Saul that the guy didn't show up, he's told the deal's off, but goes back anyway and harasses Gus until he finally admits that he is in fact the guy. He criticizes Walt for working with a dumb idiot, but Walt says he's the alpha in the relationship, and manages to convince Gus to buy his 38 pounds of product. Jane introduces Jesse to heroin, which causes him to fly up into the sky and destroy the ceiling. Meanwhile Skylar discovers Ted's tax fraud, but doesn't do anything about it because she's too horny for him. She continues working, and suddenly she feels her pregnancy being fast-tracked. At the same time, Walt gets a message from Gus that he has to deliver the meth in an hour for a cool million, and rushes over to Jesse's acting like a crazed lunatic to get the goods. All this combines for a perfect storm, where Walt finds out about Skylar's fast-approaching baby while grabbing the meth, leaving him with a decision. Either be there for the birth of his daughter, or miss it and make fat stacks of cash. 
This is such a great moment, and of course he chooses to make the deal, because he's in the empire business, not the baby business. Number 47. To Hajali. This episode is the not-so-calm before the storm that is Ozymandias, and it's just awesome. And to tell you why it's awesome in excruciating detail, I've got everyone's favourite guy, Johnny Cooper 64 back again to do my job for me. Take it away. Hello everyone, Johnny Cooper here, and Tohajali is one of my favorite episodes of Breaking Bad, and dare I say it's up there with Ozymandias. I feel like nobody gives this episode enough credit for just how great it is and how it perfectly sets up the following episode. To me, I always consider Tohajali and Ozymandias as a two-parter. One won't be as great without the other. The episode begins with more Uncle Jack and Todd Kino as they establish why Jesse isn't just kill the Nazimandias. Todd's cooking skills aren't good enough to win over Breaking Bad's number one waifu, Lydia Rodard Quell, nor are his Riz skills as he scares her off. Todd gets a call from Walter to do one last job, kill Jesse Pinkman, but a quick and painless death because he's quote unquote family as Walter puts it. Aww, how thoughtful of him. See Skylar bros, this is how a human shall act. They get into a meeting where Walter offers to pay triple of what he paid for the prison murders, but Uncle Jack doesn't want the money and instead wants Walter to give Todd a few more lessons to improve his map. Walter is hesitant but accepts. After the sting operation by Hank, Gomi, and Jesse fail, they get Huel under witness protection and troll him to reveal where Walter's money is. By showing them a fake picture of Jesse's brains all splattered out, he reveals that he and QB put the money in seven barrels and left it in the van, to where Walter drove it and buried it in the desert and gave it back to Huel. Gomez and Hank leave Huel in the safe house and that's the last we see of Huel on screen chronologically. Walter visits Andrea to lure Jesse to visit her so that the neo-Nazis who are watching the house can smoke him out, like a rat. Skylar is teaching Walt Jr. how to ring up customers, which is when Saul arrives, making Walt Jr. fanboy all over him. Saul tells Walter that he will disappear, thinking that Jesse killed him and that he's going to be next, which is why he's seen wearing a bulletproof vest. Now that Hank knows about the money being stuffed into barrels, he cooks up another scheme and has Jesse message Walter a picture of a barrel full of money buried in dirt, followed by a call threatening to burn all the money if he doesn't meet him in the desert. Walter panics and without thinking, drives supersonic mode to the desert, all while confessing to Jesse all the crimes he's ever committed to save his ass, falling for Hank's trap. Once he's there, Walt notices an SUV pull up and realizes it was a trap. Thinking that Jesse sent a hit squad to kill him, he calls up Uncle Jack to get over here before realizing that Hank and Gomi were the ones in the whip. He tells Jack not to come, but does a terrible job in calling it off as this will bite him back in a bit. Now that Hank has hard evidence on Walter, he arrests him and calls up Marie to tell her that he got THE Victory Royale of the century. That's when the episode gets even more intense. Just as you think Hank won, Uncle Jack and the gang roll up and start blasting at Hank and Gomi. They fight back and get into an epic shootout that makes you wonder, how the fuck did Hank and Gomi not land a single shot or kill one of these Nazis? Are they stupid? The episode ends on one of the biggest cliffhangers ever, setting up the ultimate downfall of Walter Wide. Number 46. Buyout. After their train heist had a little hiccup last episode, the crew has the pleasure of disposing of that kid and then deciding what to do with Todd. Jesse obviously wants to fire him, but Mike and Walt vote to keep him on, but not without a very stern warning. Mike decides that the DEA cock watching him has become too annoying and decides to leave the business, while Jesse decides to do the same after hearing Walt talk about how distraught he is over what happened to the kid, even though he's whistling without a care in the world like some fucking cartoon character. Walt finds out they're planning to sell their shares of a methylamine and launches into a diatribe about how it's worth 300 million and Jesse selling out for pennies on the dollar, aka 5 million. Jesse later calls him out for this bullshit, since he know Walt only needed barely three quarters of a million, and Walt starts complaining about how he sold out his share of grey matter for a thousand dollars, even though the company is now worth billions. Apparently a thousand dollars and five million dollars are the same thing to Walt, so he doesn't listen to Jesse's attempts to reason with him, which gets interrupted by Skylar coming home. Walt forces Jesse to stay for dinner, and it leads to one of the most captivating scenes in the entire show. 
Walt sneaks to their base of operations to try and steal the mephlamine, but Mike is one step ahead of him and forces him to stay there with him all night so he doesn't do anything stupid. I wish we got to see more of what I'm sure was a riveting night of conversation between the two, but alas, we don't. When Mike leaves to deal with some DEA malarkey, he ties Walt to the radiator so he doesn't escape. He escapes. Mike comes back from his meeting with Saul to find the mephlamine gone, but Walt has another one of his genius plans so that everybody wins. I put this episode so high because I just really love the conflict between the trio, and any solo Mike and Walt scenes are always a riot. Number 45. Vida Sen. Jimmy and Kim's argument in this episode is one of their best scenes, when they finally let out their pent-up emotions that were building up throughout the whole season. Jimmy cries like a baby about how Kim won't get an office with him, and Kim lays down the truth for him, with her last line being one of the best in the series. Jimmy, you are always down. Meanwhile, Werner is complaining about how he misses fucking his hot wife, but Mike can't sympathize since he hasn't fucked in 57 years, so Werner lets his horniness make the decisions for him and runs off. Lalo, who was introduced at the end of a previous episode, visits Hector to give him the bell he has in Breaking Bad, and then goes to begin his trolling of Gus at Poyo's. Jimmy's meeting to get his law license reinstated goes well at first until he doesn't mention Chuck, and he has a game of rage outside of a staircase. Number 44. Live free or die. Last time that fucker Johnny Cooper talked about this episode, so now you get to hear my thoughts. As far as season openers go, this is definitely one of the best, giving us a self-contained episode with some pretty light-hearted shenanigans mixed in with moments of darkness. The peak trio of Jesse, Mike, and Walt is established here, and this group dynamic is a huge part of why the first half of season 5 is some of my favourite stuff across the whole show. The scene where the three of them are arguing over what to do with a missing laptop has so many good lines. Oh yeah. We're boned. Well. You know how they say it's been a pleasure? It hasn't. Describe the building. <laughs> describe it. How about I describe Fort Knox? And what are you gonna do? Are you gonna put on your black leotard and go dangling on a clothesline? It's a building full of cops. What else do you need to know? And why in the hell am I talking to you? Oh, so now you want to blow up a police station. I don't believe I said that, no. Nursing home full of old folks just whet your appetite. Now you want to kill a bunch of cops. I never said anything about killing anybody. The actual magnet heist itself is pretty amusing to watch unfold as well, with Walt fucking him up pretty badly, then acting like everything went exactly according to plan. He's on cloud 9 after blowing up Gus, and this episode sets the stage for him in peak Heisenberg mode, where he's just a dickhead to everyone, especially Saul, and Skylar, who's having a pretty rough time after learning her husband likes exploding hospitals. And also Ted's alive, but too scared of Skylar to do anything about it, and that's the last we ever see of him thankfully. We also get our first look at Walt during his New Hampshire era, which was apparently written with no idea of where it was going, which is proof that not every piece of media needs to be planned out to be good. Also, the episode name sounds like something out of Game of Thrones. When you play the Game of Thrones, you win, or you die. Number 43, Waterworks. The penultimate episode of the final season features the return of Kim after being gone from the last two episodes, now with a new haircut. For the most part, this is like a solo Kim episode, showing her less than exciting life in Florida, complete with her new beta cuck boyfriend who can't even buy mayonnaise. Her going back to Albuquerque to confess her involvement in Howard's murder was just crazy to see the first time watching. And it shows that she took her advice to Gene to heart about turning himself in. It's cool that Cheryl stuck around for more than just two scenes in the season, and her reaction to Kim's confession is pretty depressing. In fact, this whole episode is just depressing. Gene is still on his tirade against Cancer Guy, and almost fucking murders him with a pot of his dead dog's ashes, Jesus. And this isn't even the only time he comes close to murdering someone in this episode. This is also the last we see of Jeff, which I think is just hilarious that we never find out what happened to him. Not a complaint at all, like genuinely a great decision on the writer's part. He's like Huel 2.0, which I'm sure I may be the very first person to point out. In between all this, we get scenes showing Saul and Kim's official divorce. And of course, Kim meets Jesse. Which is pretty pointless, but probably the best of a Walt slash Jesse fanservice scenes. Aaron Paul did as good a job as he possibly could here, and he looked really good considering how old he is now compared to how old Jesse is supposed to be in this scene. This is like pre-Breaking Bad. The dialogue once again did feel kinda off, but not like terrible or anything. The ending with Gene finally being exposed is an all-time great BCS moment, with the colour of a Saul Abbott reflecting in his glasses, which is a callback to the very first episode of the show. I don't think he would have actually murdered Marion, but it was still chilling to see how far he's fallen. 
And of course, him getting busted by an elderly person is just delicious irony from his Elder Law days. The best part of the episode is obviously Gene singing though. I'm not the kind of girl who gives up just like that. Number 42. Something Unforgivable. This is another episode that I gave a bit of shit when it came out, but looking back it's actually a really solid season finale, mainly for the cartel side of the plot. Nacho was working to get Lalo's trust throughout this whole season, and you can see that Lalo really valued him at this point, which makes it all the worse when he realises he betrayed him. Nacho meeting Eladio is cool, and Nacho manages to impress him with his drip and guns. The main point of contention with this episode is the shootout at Lalo's house, which almost borders on comically stupid, but I think having a wacky shootout at the end of the episode was the right move, and it's always good seeing Lalo be an unstoppable force of nature against the worst hitmen in the country. The look on his face when he realises Nacho let the hitmen in sets up a really exciting confrontation between the two in the final season, which didn't end up happening. Jimmy and Kim's side of the story is a lot less action-packed, but still has some good moments, like when Jimmy he harasses Mike for info on the Lalo plot. Slip and Kimmy is truly born in this episode, when she laughs in Howard's face after he tells her about Jimmy's chicanery, and then sets in motion the plan to ruin him, which leads to everything else being ruined. Number 41. Sunset. This episode follows Walt trying to get rid of the RV before Hank gets to it. Jesse is completely oblivious to Hank's investigations, and is in fact working on starting up his own business with Badger and Skinny Pete. Walt begins working at the Super Lab and meets Gail, who immediately starts sucking up to him. Luckily for Walt, Hank calls him up to explain his theory about the RV being a mobile meth lab, giving Walt a head start to dispose of it. He goes to get it destroyed, but Jesse finds out and drives over to it, bringing Hank right along with him. So now they're stuck in the RV while Hank tries to bust in, and this is one of my favourite scenes of the whole series. The first time watching, I just had no idea how the hell they were going to get out of this situation. Joe is there to help out by questioning the legality of what Hank's doing, and Jesse tries to assert his rights too, but when it becomes clear he isn't going to budge, Walt takes drastic measures to get him out of there, by calling up Saul to get him to troll Hank into thinking Marie is in the hospital. Hank drives off like an idiot, leaving Walt and Jesse to destroy the RV in one of the saddest death scenes of the series. Elsewhere, Gus gives the cousins for all clear to kill Hank, which I'm sure will work out great for them. Number 40, and the bags in the river. This was the episode that got me hooked on this show. The main crux of the episode revolves around Walt trying to muster up the courage to kill Crazy 8, and the way it plays out is just incredible. First, Walt tries to come up with reasons not to kill him, which doesn't seem to convince himself. Then, after he faints while bringing him food, he tries to get to know Domingo so that he can be convinced to let him go. They bond over baby cribs and whatnot, and the writing here is just so good. It finally seems like Walt's gonna let him go, until he looks at the broken pieces of a plate and realises that there's one missing. It culminates in Walt having to strangle him to death with a bike lock, which is just so depressing, and pretty crazy considering this is only the third episode of the show. And even with this really dark scene, there's still wacky shenanigans to be had, like Walt chasing Jesse around and trying to flush his meth down the toilet. Well, Heil Hitler, bitch! There's also Hank trying to show Walt Jr. that weed is bad for you since Skylar had a miscommunication with Marie, which led her to thinking Jr. was doing weed when Skylar was actually talking about Walt. We also get to see Gretchen and Walt from when they were in university, and it's all shot in shadow so you can't tell that Brian Cranston is 52 years old. Almost as good a solution as the incredible young Jimmy wig from Better Call Saul. Number 39. Gloves Off. The Mike side of this episode revolves around him and Nacho planning how to deal with Tuco, with Mike offering to snipe him dead. We get the return of an arms dealer guy Lawson from Breaking Bad, and I really like watching him and Mike talk guns. They're a great duo. I wish we had more scenes of them. Mike ends up deciding to get Tuku a different way, which involves trolling him until the cops arrive. I'm a big fan of the random shenanigans Mike gets up to this season, and this is one of the best examples of it. This is the last we see of Tuko in this show, which is a shame because I was really hoping for a Tuko lalo scene in Season 6, just because those two are kind of polar opposites while still being related. What really makes this episode a standout for me though is the Jimmy plot, which is the fallout of him airing his Davis and Maine advert without Cliff's permission. It's one of the best examples of Jimmy's thought process, as shown in both his meeting with her partners and also his conversation with Chuck, where he makes it clear that the results matter more than if he has to bend the rules to get to said results. That Chuck and Jimmy scene, by the way, one of the best scenes between the two in the whole show, with Chuck at both his most asshole-ish, but also most understandable, when he talks about how Jimmy put Kim at risk for his own benefit. You have to admit this shows a lack of judgment on her part. She knows you. She should have known better. You are such an asshole. Why? For pointing out that her one mistake was believing in you? What did I do that was so wrong? You broke the rules. <laughs> 
You turned Kim into your accessory. You embarrassed Howard, who, God help him, inexplicably vouched for you with Cliff Main. Jimmy trying to get Chuck to extort him is also a good example of no matter how much Chuck wants to end Jimmy's antics, his adherence to the law trumps everything else. And Ona Kirk obviously does an amazing job acting, as always. Oh, come on, you can't be pissed off at her about this. I'm not. Howard is. Howard is probably at his most villainous at this point in the show, where he sends Kim to the cornfields as a result of Jimmy's chicanery. But like Chuck, his thought process is totally understandable. There's really no true villains of this show, at least not until Lalo arrives. Number 38. End Times. This episode sets the stage for the final showdown against Gus, with Walt and his family officially being open season. The family is shipped off to Gus's house after the anonymous tip last episode, leaving Walt on his own to come up with a plan. Hank sends Gomez out to the laundry to try and find evidence, all while Jesse and Tyrus are in the lab underneath, but he comes up empty-handed because he's an idiot. Jesse gets a call from Andrea saying that Brock's in the hospital, and when he goes to have a ciggy and realizes the ricin one's gone, he deduces that it was stolen by Huel when he visited Seoul earlier. Of course he's right, but when he goes to confront Walt about it, he gets gaslit into thinking it was actually Gus, since we all know Walt would never stoop to such levels to get what he wants. This scene between the two of them is just so damn good. In fact, Brian Cranston's acting here might be a bit too convincing since Walt is supposed to be lying out of his ass throughout the whole scene. Now is probably a good time to talk about my grievances with the Brock poisoning plot, mainly how we just have no idea how Walt actually managed to poison him in the first place. Like, did he get Saul to do it, or did he sneak the berries from the Lily of the Valley into his lunchbox or some shit? And if so, how the hell did he do that? I get why they didn't show it, since we need to keep the audience in the dark for the plot twist at the end of Face Off, and it doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things, but it's always annoyed me regardless. Anyways, now the Dream Team is back together, and they go to execute their plan by having Jesse lure Gus to the hospital, while Walt makes a bomb in his kitchen. Unfortunately, Jesse makes it too obvious that he wants Gus dead, and he wisens up to what's going on right when he's about to get in his car. Or maybe this bird flying by told him about it. Number 37. Box Cutter. What a hell of a way to start a season. Right after season 3's cliffhanger, Jesse gets captured and taken down to the lab where Walt and Mike are, and they all get to sit there and wait for Gus to come visit. Walt tries to talk himself up while they wait, and eventually Victor gets sick of him and decides to try his hand at cooking the blue stuff, since he's apparently watched him do it so much that he knows the entire recipe. When Gus eventually rolls up, he doesn't say a word and just struts over to get changed agonizingly slowly while Walt rambles on, and just when you think there's no way out for Walt and Jesse, he randomly slashes Victor's throat instead. Even Mike is shocked, but Jesse is out of fucks to give. Since it'd be a pain to dig up the lab to chuck Victor in that hole with Lalo and Howard, they instead dissolve him with the acid, which is honestly a way better method of disposal. I guess Gus and Mike just didn't know about it back then. Walt and Jesse go to Denny's with their new drip for a nice meal, with Walt thinking Gus is going to get them the first chance he gets, and Jesse just deciding to go with the flow. This entire plotline throughout the episode is just so tense, and I kind of wish it was the entire episode, since the non-lab scenes aren't anything to write home about. Skylar doesn't know where Walt mysteriously vanished to, so she goes to his condo to look for clues, except she can't get in. So she calls up a locksmith to gaslight into letting her in, only to find nothing. This scene is pretty funny though. Meanwhile, Hank still being a to Marie, and needs her help to do a poopy. Unfortunately, he doesn't have Tony the Toilet Buddy to encourage him. Number 36. Hit and Run. Considering this episode is the one after Nacho's death, Hit and Run has no reason to go as hard as it does. Some pretty major plot things happen this episode, while also bringing back a lot of that season 1 charm that I was missing. We finally get some insight into Howard's personal life, with the mention of a significant other that he isn't on the best terms with. Jimmy enters the scene to do what he does best, impersonating Howard. Wacky shenanigans ensue, and Wendy shows up to assist, thus deconfirming the Kim equals Wendy theory, unfortunately. They even made sure to put Kim and Wendy in the same shot just to make it crystal clear. Cliff is utterly perplexed by all this, which continues his role this season of being utterly perplexed by everything. Jimmy having to eat lunch by himself because no one wants to sit with him thanks to the whole Lalo thing is both funny and sad, especially when even Oakley doesn't want to troll him anymore. Saul has way too many clients at the nail salon, including Spooge himself, so we finally get the introduction of his Breaking Bad office, although a bit more minimalist than usual. This is also the last time we see both the nail salon and Mrs. Nguyen, truly the end of an era. Meanwhile, Kim is paranoid about being followed wherever she goes, and she ends up finally meeting Mike, which was pretty crazy to see the first time watching. He tells her about Lalo being alive, but not Saul, because he knows Kim is an alpha girl boss, and Jimmy is a beta crybaby. 
The cold open of the episode introduces us to Gus Fring's cartoon underground lair, with a tunnel connecting his house to another one next door. I don't know if he already had this set up, or if he somehow put it together after Lalo was revealed to still be alive, but either way it's pretty ridiculous, in a good way. It shows just how much of a paranoid scaredy cat Gus really is when he doesn't have the situation fully under control. This is also the first and last episode to be directed by Ray Seahorn, and she did a pretty spectacular job I would say. I don't know how much input the director actually has on a show like this, but there's some pretty fancy shots to be found here, with the main attraction being this POV door shot. Bravo Seahorn. Number 35. Dead Freight. Most of the episodes in this top 20 are full of drama, dialogue, intrigue, and other nonsense like that. And while those are all well and good, sometimes what you really want is badass action. Dead Freight is just awesome, with a gang putting aside their boring meth empire plot to go rob a train together. First off, there's this great scene where the Motley crew forces Lydia to prove her innocence by calling up the DEA to report the tracker room a barrel of methylamine, while the boys listen in for a bug that Walt put in Hank's office earlier. Right when it's starting to look like Lydia betrayed them after all, they hear that some schmuck did put the tracker on the barrel, so it turns out she's in the clear. Mike still wants to waste her because he's a dick, so she offers them a way to get an ocean of methylamine from a train. Mike thinks there's no way to do the heist without killing the crew, but Walt seems pretty eager to go through with it, since the alternative is going back to a pseudo-cook. Jesse has another of his genius ideas to just rob the train without them knowing. The trio plus Todd put the plan into action, plus Bill Burr acting as the troller blocking the train. The whole heist is filmed and edited so well, and while there are some more impressive action sequences in Better Call Saul, I think this is my favourite across both shows. It's clever, it's tense, it's just cool. Especially when the Good Samaritan arrives to push Kubi's truck off the road, and the train starts moving with Todd and Jesse still on it. And just when you think they succeeded and it was all just a fun little adventure, the kid shows up to ruin it. Thankfully, Todd takes care of him. Number 34. J.M.M. This episode has everything you could possibly want. A wedding, a giant explosion, Kim being an alpha, Jimmy in his underwear, sex, Jimmy defending Lalo in court, Kino cinematography, Lydia, Jimmy going psycho mode on Howard, and Huel. The wedding scene might be the last time Kim and Jimmy were truly happy together, and thankfully Huel's there to capture the moment. The scene where Kim and Rich are being chewed out for supposedly screwing up the Acker case, and Kim turns it around on Kevin, is super satisfying. And I love how Rich just goes along with it and doesn't really add anything. Nacho and Gus go on a side mission to blow up some random Poyos building, and we get our epic badass walking away from explosion scene. Gus meets up with Shula and Lydia for a freeway, and brings up his mysterious Santiago backstory that is introduced in this season and never elaborated on again. This is sadly the last time we will ever see Lydia, thanks to her not being available for season 6. Jimmy and Mike finally have some more screen time together, and Mike gives him some info to help in Gus's convoluted plan to get Lalo out of jail. Jimmy's clearly disturbed by the fact that he's helping this crazy murder man get away with killing a random guy, but he likes money too much to do anything about it, so he decides to take it out on Howard instead, who calls him out for being a meanie head. It's interesting that the first thing Jimmy brings up in his rant is Howard supposedly killing Chuck, which shows that his brother's still on his mind almost two seasons after his death. Maybe Jimmy's lightning powers of a reason Chuck always hated him, what with the allergy to electricity and all that. Number 33. Point and Shoot. This episode is one that when it was released, I thought it was an easy 10 out of 10, and one of the best episodes of Better Call Saul. But after re-watching it approximately 50 times, I do have some issues that stop it from being in the top 10. The chief among these is that Lalo's death just feels kinda rushed. The way the last episode ended, I was expecting some kind of new plotline to spring up where Lalo is using Jimmy and Kim to just mess with Mike or some shit, and while he does technically do this, it's just for one episode then he fails immediately. That's probably my bad for letting my mind run wild with predictions during the six week wait for this episode, especially when there are only a couple episodes left in the season. Cooper had this awesome theory about what would happen with Lalo that I'd recommend watching if you guys are interested. Anyway, the other minor issue I have with this episode is that Mike is just a big idiot the whole time, but that's just part of a course for him. I like that Gus gets his moment in the spotlight to deal with the situation himself instead of just leaving it to Mike, and it was pretty satisfying watching his confrontation with Lalo, even though it was incredibly telegraphed exactly what was going to happen. All the stuff with Jimmy and Kim in this episode is amazing, especially the first scene with Lalo and the last scene with Mike. Jimmy was convincing Lalo so well with his chicanery, but he had me thinking he was trying to screw over Kim, even though it turned out to be obviously for her safety. The scene with Mike drilling them on the new order of things is my favourite. I love how passive-aggressive he is with his remarks about the Howard scheme. There will be cocaine in the upholstery. That's the story you were setting up for this guy, yeah? You keep telling the lie that you've been telling. 
Plus his callback to his first episode back in Breaking Bad is great. You woke up, you found her, that's all you know. Didn't make a lick of sense. Then he left, that's all you know. We've also got classic scenes like Lyle making his last appearance on the show to sing the Poyos theme song or something. The opening scene with Howard's car at the beach is pretty stunning. And the last scene of the episode is one of the most suppressing of the whole series. Seeing Lalo and Howard in that hole together for the first time was truly something, and the music fits it so well. In fact, the music throughout this whole episode is non-stop bangers, some of Dave Porter's best work. Speaking of the visuals for a moment, while I do appreciate this reference to when Walt tried to execute Gus, I do think the lighting and colour grading for this episode is just a bit too dark. I have to brighten it up a bit for these videos, otherwise YouTube compression will turn it into unwatchable goop. It's not the long night levels are bad or anything, but it was kinda distracting. Also, the entire plot of the episode leaks like three weeks ahead of a release because those idiots decided to do an early screening for some film festival, so that was nice. Number 32. Rico. This episode might just be my pick for the most underrated episode in the whole show. It's the start of a Sandpiper case, which is when the show goes from really, really good to insanely good. The cold open is easily the best one to analyse on rewatch, since it's so easy to tell Chuck's true feelings on Jimmy passing the bar, with the knowledge of what he says in Pimento. Is this a joke? No, no joke. Wow. I don't know what to say. Are you proud of me? Hmm? Oh, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks. Consider hiring me. As what? Oh, a, a lawyer, obviously. And we see the beginnings of Chuck using Howard as the scapegoat for Jimmy to blame, for not hiring him at HHM. The main plot of the episode is the discovery of Sandpiper taking advantage of their elderly clients, which leads to the one time in the entire show that Chuck and Jimmy work together on a case. It's nice to see Jimmy being so excited about seemingly getting what he's always wanted, to be an equal alongside his brother, which makes what happens next episode all the more tragic. Jimmy writing his demand letter on the toilet paper and later dumpster diving for shredded documents are both comedy gold, especially when Rich calls Jimbo while he's in the trash. Enjoy the magic flute. Blow my magic flute. Rich is another one of those goated side characters who he really did not get enough of in the show. Just a class act all around. And he has by far the swankiest law firm in Albuquerque. He tries to intimidate Jimmy and Chuck and throws them a lowball offer, but Chuck isn't having any of it. Meanwhile, Stacy not so subtly nudges Mike towards getting her more money for expenses, so he visits Caldera to get some less than official work. The stinger at the end of Chuck casually going outside to grab a box of documents is an intriguing development, and rounds out what I would call a practically perfect episode. Number 31. Pilot. The first episode of a show is everything you could want. It wastes no time setting up our protagonists and all the side characters, the initial conflict is born, and then it's off to the races for a high-octane meth-cooking adventure. This is the longest episode of a series, and it packs so much into that one-hour runtime, it's kinda crazy. We go from Walt sitting around eating veggie bacon at the start, to him murdering people with explosive shit by the end of it. The very first scene immediately hooks you, with Walt driving around in his knickers and recording his message to Skylar and Flynn. Jesse's introduction is equally exciting, with him jumping out his window naked. When you think about it, everything that happens in this show is really Hank's fault, since he's the one who showed Walt how much money there is to be made in the meth business, and taking him on the ride along where he recognises Jesse, and later blackmails him into cooking with him. Jesse introduces us to Crazy 8 and the one episode wonder Emilio, who wouldn't make another appearance until 14 years later, in the second last episode of Better Call Saul. This is a good time to talk about the cinematography on this show, which is pretty great. Breaking Bad was shot on 35mm film, and it gives the show this delicious grainy look that fits perfectly for the vibe of it. And pretty much every shot has a slight handheld shakiness to it, which I'm less crazy about. I do think Better Call Saul has a much better presentation, but the clean digital footage with more locked off shots and smooth camera moves suits that show more than it would this one. Both do their jobs effectively, even if I do prefer Saul on the whole. We're also introduced to the first of many meth cooking montages, something that gets better and better as the show progresses. This is easily the best episode of season 1 for me, and thanks to it we eventually got to witness some of the best characters on TV, like Daniel Wormold and Tony the Toilet Buddy. My favourite scenes are actually in my favourite episode, and that would be the pilot episode, episode 1. Uh, it just really set the journey for all these characters to, to evolve and to grow and it, it definitely set the tone for the rest of the, the season, the rest of the series and, um, and just the cinematics of what we shot and the 
big scale of using New Mexico landscape to me in Austin is back to episode one. Number 30, Uno. I rewatched this episode of some friends who've never seen Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul before, and I was reminded of how amazingly this first episode sets up the show. That first scene after the cold open of everyone waiting around for Jimmy to come in and do his lawyer thing really sets the mood, that this isn't going to be quite as action-packed as Breaking Bad often was. There's some pretty clever camera work in this episode, like when Jimmy is walking towards a car that looks a whole lot like the one in Breaking Bad, but the camera moves to reveal his much less desirable car that he actually drives. I love how the writers don't really outright tell you anything, and assume the audience is smart enough to figure things out for themselves. Like the Cinnabon sequence at the start doesn't have a title card that says 6 months after Breaking Bad or something like that, and Jimmy doesn't make any explicit reference to Chuck being allergic to electricity. You can figure out who this Chuck guy that Jimmy and Howard are talking about is based on the name of a firm if you're paying attention. It all just feels so natural, like we were just dropped into a random day in the life of Jimmy McGill. This is probably a good time to mention how much I love how the show is shot, especially compared to Breaking Bad. In that show the camera was always handheld, and I'm not really a big fan of shaky cam to begin with, so I didn't really like that. BCS often uses locked off shots and smooth camera moves that just look a whole lot better to me. The different styles do fit each show, and there are times that BCS does use handheld, like in the gene sequence of the start of the episode. And while I do love the Breaking Bad intro, I do think the Better Call Saul one is more interesting, with how it changes throughout the show. Jimmy's wacky misadventures with the skateboard kids is a good way to introduce us to his scheming side, and of course it blows up spectacularly at the end of the episode, leaving on a cliffhanger that does work if you have no idea who Tuco is, but works even better if you do know. Also, I would totally live in this nail salon, the vibes are just impeccable. Number 29, Gliding Over All. The mid-season finale sees Walt trying to tie up loose ends after idiotically killing Mike. Now that he's the only vote left, he visits Lydia to get the name of Mike's guys, and then hires Uncle Jack to dispose of all of them in two minutes. This scene is just brutal, with most of the guys being stabbed repeatedly, and one of them getting the pleasure of being burned alive. All set to a nice upbeat song while Walt stares out the window like a cartoon supervillain. Hank finds out and isn't too happy about it, and reminisces about his old job with Walt. Lydia manages to extend her use-by date by proposing a business plan with Walt to ship his product to the Czech Republic, so him and Todd get to work cooking a shit ton of meth over the next three months, in one of the best montages of the show, set to the very appropriate song, Crystal Blue Persuasion. Eventually, Skylar gets bored of laundering the money, and shows Walt the fruits of his labor, a giant pile big enough to have a nap on. Walt decides it's probably time to call it quits, and visits Jesse to give him his five million and reminisce about the good old days. So everything's back to normal, everything's happy-go-lucky until Hank goes to take a dump and finds the Walt Whitman book that Walt idiotically left there, ending on one of the biggest cliffhangers in the show. Thankfully these days we don't have to wait a year to see what happens next. It only took Hank five seasons to figure out who Heisenberg is, but at least he got there in the end. Number 28. Cobbler. The star of this episode is absolutely Daniel Wormold aka Price. After his extremely valuable baseball cards are stolen, he enlists for cops to find them for him. Mike catches wind of this, gives him a speech about ACAB, and sets out to find the cards himself. Mike obviously knows it was Nacho, and he proposes an idea that will benefit both of them. Price does get the cards back, but at the cost of his prized Hummer, which leads to the best exchange in the whole show. You think I'd be caught dead driving that thing? It looks like a school bus for six-year-old pimps. Alright, shall we move this along? I'm dead serious when I say the price scenes are some of my favourites in the show, and it's such a missed opportunity that he didn't pop back up for some silly capers after season 3. The conclusion to this baseball cards plot is Mike enlisting Jimmy to get the cops off Price, and he does this by coming up with the most elaborate insane story I think we've ever seen from him, and of course it works because the cops are stupid. Jimmy gets his iconic travel mug from Kim, and it fits perfectly in his Suzuki, but doesn't fit in his new car. Bit of subtle foreshadowing there, love to see it. For the time being though, Jimmy's doing A-OK -okay at Davis and Maine, until Chuck bursts in to ruin the fun. Curious how Jimmy's acceptance of Mike's morally flexible work is a direct result of Chuck's actions at HHM, once again showing that he brings out the worst in Jimmy. Kim finds out about his light fabrication of evidence and makes it clear she wants nothing to do with it, ending the episode on a less than truthful note. Number 27, Salude. This is where Gus's revenge plan he's been brewing for the past two decades finally comes together, with him heading to Mexico with Mike and Jesse to settle some cartel disputes. 
First, Jesse has to prove his worth by cooking up the blue stuff while everyone watches. And after getting berated for not knowing how to synthesize some acid, he takes control and calls the lab crew out for having such a disgusting setup, and tells them that no cooking is going to happen until all the contaminant has been cleared. Much like Walt when there was contamination in the super lab. Jesse's cook turns out to be almost as good as Walt's, so they go to Don Eladio's to celebrate. Gus brings along a bottle of Zafiro Aneo that happens to be the same one Jimmy and Kim took a liking to, except his has the little side effect of making the entire cartel drop dead. Thankfully Gus had the foresight to vomit in the toilet beforehand so he can strut out and take in the sight of Don Eladio falling in the pool. This whole sequence is just so satisfying to watch play out, and the shot of Gus walking outside and seeing the carnage with the music in the background is hard as fuck. Meanwhile, it's Flynn's birthday, and he's gifted an awesome car from Skylar, although he doesn't seem to entirely appreciate it because he's an ungrateful c Walt isn't there for the festivities, so Junior drives over to his apartment where he finds him crying like a baby over how Jesse beat him up. Later on, Walt tries to get back on Flynn's good side by telling him about his father who had Huntington's disease, and Brian Cranston's acting here is top tier. Junior doesn't really care though and leaves. Saul calls Ted over to his office to give him the good slash bad news that his great aunt Birgit has passed and left him the precise amount of money he needs to pay off the IRS. So he immediately takes the money and buys a new car because he's an idiot. Skylar tries to make him see reason and admits the money actually came from her, but Ted is still too stubborn to do the right thing. The Walt and Skylar scenes in this episode are really good, but the spotlight is all on the Gus plot, and it's nice to see that he got to complete his big revenge plan before he gets blowed up by Hector a few days later. Number 26. Rock and Hard Place. This is Nacho's grand finale, only three episodes into season 6. I guess this season didn't really have time for Nacho, so the writers had to deal with him as early on as possible. I was practically certain that Nacho and Lalo would have some sort of confrontation this season, and while that didn't happen, I still think this is probably as good an ending he possibly could have gotten. The twins once again continue being idiots, so Nacho manages to get away from them. His last conversation with his daddy is just painful to watch, with Nacho knowing this is the last time he'll ever hear his voice. It is good to see him actually have the upper hand on Gus for once, since he's basically been taking L after L since season 4. We can also see how far Mike has fallen from Grace, since Gus is pretty much directly responsible for Nacho's death, but Mike just keeps working for him anyway. In between the grim stuff, we have more of Jimmy and Kim continuing their wacky scheme against Howard, with the return of Huel for his last episode. I really do like the scene of copying Howard's keys, but it all just feels kind of out of place compared to the other stuff going on in this episode. I honestly think they should've just made this all Nacho for the entire episode. Kinda like chicanery was for the lawyer plot. Nacho's last scene is everything you could hope for, with him finally expressing his disdain for the Salamancas and Gus. Him revealing he put Hector in that chair is easily the best part. And while it is satisfying to see him say all that before shooting himself, it's still pretty bleak that this guy who was just trying to get out of a game for ages never managed to succeed. This episode honestly just made me hate Mike and Gus even more, even with Mike's promise to protect his father and all that. I'm glad that Mike ended up being killed by a bald beta cuck for no reason. Oh yeah, and the cold open is pretty spectacular. Number 25, Koshata. The quest to free Huel Babino is hands down the best scheme Jimmy and Kim ever concocted. Every aspect of it is just genius, and the way it's executed is truly a joy to watch. Jimmy takes a bus ride down to Huel's hometown and gets everyone there to write a bunch of letters pretending to be staunch supporters of Huel's rules, which flusters the judge to make Kim and Suzanne Erickson resolve the case without causing a fuss. This leads to Erickson doing some detective work to find out why Huel is so beloved, where we see Jimmy set up a high-tech website showing his accomplishments, and has also set up a million phones in the nail salon for him and his camera crew to use to fool her. This is easily the best part of the episode, with Jimmy and Drama Girl doing accents to sell the ruse, and Jimmy coming up with a story on the spot about Huel saving people from a fire. I also love this scene where Mrs. Nguyen gives Jimmy relationship advice, but it turns out in his case, the best way to mend a relationship is to commit highly illegal crimes. After this, Kim is clearly bored by her normal work with Mesa Verde, so she tells Jimmy she wants to do it again. Meanwhile, Mike and the German gang go to a strip club, and Mike and Werner have a one-on-one -on -one hangout sesh where they have a conversation about their past and stuff. Kai causes a ruckus and Mike has to deal with him, and when he gets back to Werner he finds out he's been blabbing about the lab construction, which is basically the beginning of the end for him. Nacho flexes his alpha leadership on Crazy 8 and goes home to his crackhead girlfriends, and then at the end of the episode we're finally introduced to Lalo, who gives some very subtle foreshadowing on Nacho's eventual fate. Nunca en tu vida has probado algo tan delicioso, eh? De verdad. Mira, espérame, espérame. Te vas a morir. Number 24, Say My Name. 
Mike's story comes to an unceremonious end this episode, but we'll get to that in a minute. Walt uses his Heisenberg charm to convince Declan to be his new meth distributor, but conveniently leaves Jesse out when it comes to Mike and him retiring from a crew. Jesse later tries to get his 5 mil from Walt so he can dip, but instead is treated to another wave of manipulation, first of Walt trying to butter him up, but then when that doesn't work, he resorts to basically saying who gives a shit we're gonna go to hell anyway lol. Jesse just gives up and leaves while Walt yells at him like a spoiled child. He replaces Jesse with local child killer Todd, and tries to tell Skylar about it but she ain't interested. Meanwhile Mike is enjoying his new freedom by trolling the DEA by dumping all his criminal shit before they come to search his house. But the fun runs out when his lawyer gets caught during his routine hazard pay deposit. Thankfully Walt happens to be in Hank's office when he hears about it, so he calls Mike to give him a head start on the cops. Mike decides he'd rather abandon Kaylee than be caught, so he runs off and calls Saul to get his emergency bag to him. Saul's too much of a pussy to do it, so Walt does instead, with him also trying to get the names of Mike's guys in prison from him. Mike tells him to get fucked, and rips into him about how everything went to shit ever since he joined the drug business. It's satisfying as hell to see Walt get verbally demolished, but it's also true that Mike's basically a huge hypocrite in this scene. Mike makes the fatal mistake of hurting Walt's feelings, and gets a bullet in the chest for it. Walt suddenly realises he could just ask Lydia for the names, and tries to apologise, which is just laughable, but thankfully Mike shuts him up before he can ruin the moment anymore. In the end, Mike got killed by a bald loser and left his family nothing. Probably a bit unsatisfying after seeing all the shit he did throughout this show and Better Call Saul, but I think it's what he deserved at the end of the day. Number 23. Lantern. At the time of release, this was easily the darkest episode of the show, with Chuck's storyline and life coming to a fiery end. The whole season was quietly building to this moment, and seeing Chuck tear his house apart when he was so close to getting better is just painful, even if he was the closest thing the show had to a villain at that point. Jimmy and Chuck's last conversation is just more pain on top of that, with Jimmy wanting to make amends but Chuck being too much of a dickhead to reciprocate. It's pretty obvious that Chuck didn't really mean it when he said Jimmy didn't matter to him, when he's made it apparent throughout the show that he's basically obsessed with him, but the fact that this is the last thing he says to him probably ended up playing a big part in how Jimmy deals with Chuck's death in season 4. And speaking of his death, the final scene of the episode may be the single most haunting moment of the series. It's almost kind of scary watching it, with the destroyed house and silence only interrupted by the sound of him kicking the desk. And this is also the first episode to not use the usual credits theme at the end, which was a pretty necessary choice but just adds to that feeling of witnessing something really messed up. The only halfway decent thing that happens in this episode is Hector getting taken out by Nacho Sugar Pills, or at least he would have if it weren't for Gus intervening because his hate boner is too strong. Gus's sneaky eyes at Nacho may in fact be confirmation of his gayness. On a lighter note, Kim and Francesca go to Blockbuster, and Jimmy manages to fix the hole he dug Irene into, although it doesn't really change the fact that he just destroyed this woman's social life for his own financial gain. Number 22. Grilled. In what was originally supposed to be the finale of Season 1, Grilled sees the short-lived Tuco plot come to an explosive end, with him kidnapping the meth-cooking duo and taking them out to his vacation home in the desert. Every scene with these characters in this episode is incredibly tense, with this being the first big moment where you're left wondering how the hell Walt and Jesse again get themselves out of this situation. They almost get lucky when Jesse tries to convince Tuco to try their latest meth slash ricin invention, but he loses interest when Jesse mentions chili powder as the secret ingredient. They manage to sneak it into a scrumptious burrito instead, but Hector isn't quite as senile as he seems to be, and exposes him by ringing his bell non-stop until Tuco figures out what's up. Things eventually escalate to Tuco throwing them out of a house and putting a big gun to Jesse's head, but Walt interrupts him by dropping a pretty badass revelation. We tried to poison you. Because you're an insane, degenerate piece of filth, and you deserve to die. They manage to beat Tuco up and try to get out of there, but Hank shows up at the perfect time to have a heated showdown with him. This is really Tuco's episode in the spotlight, and it's a great send-off to one of the most memorable characters, which is impressive considering he was only in four episodes. The non-Tuco-centric plotlines are just kind of whatever, with Marie and Skylar going around putting up missing posters while Hank tries to find Jesse, which is what ends up leading him to Tuco in the end. Number 21. Phoenix. This has got to be my pick for the most underrated episode of this series, because I feel like I never see anyone talking about it online. This episode is amazing. The whole thing is about parents and their relationships with their children, and it all culminates in one of the most important scenes of the whole show. Walt misses the birth of his daughter thanks to his greed, but at least Ted was there for Skylar. Jesse freaks out when he finds out the meth is missing, and when he calls up Walt about it, he just hangs up on him because he's a dick. 
When Jesse confronts him about it face to face, Walt refuses to give him his share of the cash, since he'll apparently use the all to kill himself with drugs. When Jane finds out about this, she gets real interested, since her dad's being a real pain in her ass, almost calling the cops on her when he catches her and Jesse shooting the shit. This scene where Jesse defends himself with a baseball bat is so funny. Jane wants Jesse to get his money from Walt so they can move to New Zealand or whatever, and blackmails him into bringing it to them. There's this fantastic scene where Walt goes to a bar while he's supposed to be out buying diapers, and coincidentally meets up with Donald himself. They have this great talk about their families, and Walt mentions his so-called nephew, aka Jesse, with Donald giving him some good advice. Family. Can't give up on them. Never. This scene is just so fucking good. Walt goes back to Jesse to try and talk some sense into him, and we all know how this scene goes. In my opinion, this is hands down the worst thing Walt ever did letting an innocent person die solely for his own gain. The fact that he stopped for even a second to consider the notion of letting Jane die is utterly reprehensible, and it was originally going to be even worse. Yeah, apparently the original script had Walt injecting more heroin into Jane to purposefully have her overdose, which I'm glad they changed because that's just way too far. Even still, the scene is just so shocking, and it stands out as one of the defining moments of Walt's character arc. On a lighter note, Junior sets up the Save Walter White website, but Walt is an ungrateful bitch and complains to Saul about how he hates charity. Saul apparently knows a Discord mod in Belarus who can launder Walt's money through the website, which Walt still doesn't seem very grateful for. But yeah, incredible episode, best of season 2, RIP Jane. Number 20. Witness. After a bit of a low-key season opener, the second episode of season 3 kicks it into high gear with an insanely good episode. Mike's detective work from last episode finally pays off with the epic reveal of Poyo's Hermanos, and he enlists Jimmy to go in and find out what's going on. I love seeing Jimmy really out of his element but still putting in the effort to do the job properly, and the gag of him filling his coffee with loads of sugar and being disgusted when he drinks it is good shit. Saul meets Gustavo, which is something the writers couldn't really do in the show since Saul doesn't know Gus in Breaking Bad, but they managed to get away with it anyway and it's a sight to behold. Jimmy's enthusiasm to be doing detective work with Mike is sadly cut off by Mike being Mike. We meet Francesca, who's looking a lot happier than she did in Breaking Bad, and Jimmy puts her to work immediately. Ernesto tells Kim about Chuck's tape, so she gets Jimmy to give her a dollar, like how he does with Walt and Jesse in Breaking Bad. Jimmy's clearly disturbed by the fact that Chuck got one over him for once, but Kim is confident they can get past it. There's this highly amusing scene of Howard running through people's backyards, and then we arrive at possibly my favourite scene of the whole series, Jimmy breaking into Chuck's house. Odenkirk is so good at angry screamer performances, and his line deliveries here are the stuff of legends. You pulled that heartstrings con job on me, you piece of shit! No wonder Rebecca left you! What took her so long? For this, you destroyed our family? Are you happy now? For what? For nothing! Is that all there is, Chuck? Is that all there is? How'd you make copies, huh, Chuck? Huh? Number 19. Bagman. This is the big, epic action set piece of basically the whole show, and I think this might be Vince Gilligan's best work from a directing standpoint. Obviously we aren't going to be fearing for Jimmy or Mike's lives during any of this unless you don't know Breaking Bad exists. But even so, the shootout is filmed so well that I don't really care. The cinematography throughout this episode and the whole season is just on point, with some pretty inspired shots. Kim meeting Lalo is something that none of us wanted to see, and it's suitably ominous. This episode also features the most tragic death in the entire series, the Suzuki Esteem. May it rest in peace. One of my minor complaints of the show after season 2 was that Mike and Jimmy didn't get together for some misadventures nearly as much as I would have liked, so to get an entire episode of just them walking around the desert was exactly what I wanted. We get to see Mike give Saul some motivation by talking about why he does what he does, although it is a shame that in the end he dies for nothing and leaves his family nothing. Jimmy refusing to use the space blanket is a smart way of showing that Chuck's memory is still looming over him 24-7, no matter how much he tries to ignore it. And the last sequence of Mike sniping the car is once again super well made, topped off with Jimmy drinking his own piss. I don't think this is the best episode of all time like some people seem to, but it's undeniable how good it is, even if it isn't exactly the usual BCS jig. Number 18. Better Call Soul. This is officially where the show gets good, and it's thanks to none other than Slip and Jimmy himself. I know we take Saul Goodman for granted at this point, but I kind of forgot until my most recent watch just how funny he is. Like, literally every line he has is some sort of zinger, and they're all bangers. What did, what did the academy hire you right out of the womb? You guys get younger every- There are laws, detective. Have your kindergarten teacher read them to you, right? Go grab a juice box, have a nap, go on. Ah, oh, here we go. Public masturbation. 
I don't get it. What's the kick? Why don't you do it at home like the rest of us with a big flat screen TV, 50 channels of pay-per-view in a Starbucks? That's nice. <laughs> she better act in an epileptic whorehouse. <laughs> is that like the one your mom works at? Uh, is she still offering the two-for-one discount? <laughs> After watching Better Call Saul, the show not the episode, it's almost jarring seeing him here, with how much more depth was added to him throughout that whole show. I guess this is a good moment to talk about how much I just love Saul's office as a location. The inflatable Lady Liberty, the blue carpet, the constitution wallpaper, it all just comes together so well to create something memorable and iconic. Plus his car is cool as hell. This episode is also retroactively made better with Breaking Bad, the episode not the show, having additional scenes that take place during this episode, mainly the RV scene which is kind of pointless, and the Mike scene which recontextualizes the entire thing, with Saul wanting to work with Walt despite Mike's rightful objections. But enough about that, the episode itself is just a whole lot of fun, with Badger getting arrested and Walt plus Jesse turning to Saul to get it all sorted out. The initial scene where Badger gets arrested is classic, with him taunting the guy for being the worst undercover cop ever until he gets pulled in by a chicanery. The scenes of Saul meeting Mr. Mayhew and later being kidnapped are both Kino, with random throwaway lines turning into key characters years down the road. No, it wasn't me, it was Ignacio, he's the one! Lalo didn't send you, no Lalo! Who? Oh, thank God! Oh, Christ! Saul's scheme to get Badger off is the usual wacky shenanigans we've come to expect from him, with them sending out a decoy guy to get caught on purpose and pass him off as Heisenberg. Kinda stupid, but the way it plays out is just so funny, with him sitting on the wrong bench so Walt has to send Jesse to get Badger to move, while Walt does some chicanery to distract Hank. Just beautiful. Such an awesome episode. Number 17. Crawl Space. This episode is a classic. Beloved by all, including me, but there's someone I know who loves it even more than anyone else, so I'll let him talk about it instead. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, it's me, Beat Rice. HN Films has graciously given me the wonderful opportunity to talk about one of my personal favorite episodes in the entire Breaking Bad universe, Crawl Space. I've already talked about this episode ad nauseum in my own Breaking Bad ranking video, but I'm gonna do it again because it's funny. Crawl Space is a part of the Season 4 ending quadrilogy, one of the hottest and most consistent ones in the entire show. So many insane events go down between these four episodes, but Crawl Space is the one that I believe deserves the most praise. The episode takes place right after Gus's showdown with the cartel and Saloon, with Gus recovering in a makeshift hospital after intentionally poisoning himself. Him and Jesse eventually hop the border back to Albuquerque, but Mike isn't so lucky, as he's forced to recover in Mexico and fuck off for the rest of the season. This has some pretty major consequences in the future, as Mike definitely would have advised Gus to kill Walt in the middle of the desert later in the episode, rather than just leaving him out to dry. Gus makes fun of Hector for having a dead family like a total loser, while Hank spies on the chicken farm with Walt. Hank's investigations eventually lead him to wanting to check out the laundromat, but luckily Walt pulls a fast one and bangs a Yui in front of some poor guy's car. This leads Hank to disabled for like the 18th time in the show, and Marie bans him from going on secret investigations with Walt. Skyler tells Ted to do his fucking taxes, but Ted says no because he's a dumbass. One of my favorite aspects of this episode is the Ted Beneke tax evasion subplot. Ted is easily one of the worst characters in the entire series, because the only things that he does besides be annoying is evade his taxes and fuck Skyler. That might sound like heaven to some people, but to the viewing audience, any scene involving a one-on-one -on -one with him and Skyler is completely unbearable, but what makes his appearance in this episode so great is the absolutely genius way that he's used in the plot. Skyler uses Walt's drug money to pay off Ted's taxes, since her involvement in his tax fraud would have likely put her and Walt under suspicion from the government. After Ted eats shit and is forced to hand over the check, it eventually leads to the unbelievable climax that I'll be climaxing over in a few moments. Anyways, Ted says nuh -uh in regards to paying his taxes, but the carpet decides to step in with a rebuttal. Later, as Walt cooks in the lab, he realizes that somebody else was cooking without his knowledge and Walt shits his pants, realizing that Gus may be giving him the boot here soon. He rushes over to Jesse's house, telling him that Gus is trying to use Jesse to replace himself. But Jesse says ad hominem and leaves. Walt gets his balls tasered by Tyrus, and he's taken out to the desert, where the greatest 10 minutes in television history begin to take place. The last couple segments of this episode is definitely what it's most known for, and for very good reason. We're taken on this roller coaster of emotion, from Walt being told by Gus that he's going to murder Hank, and that if he tries to stop him, he'll kill the rest of his family too, to Walt rushing into Saul's office in a scene that blends both comedy and drama perfectly, to one of the best scenes in the entire show. Walt finds out that Skyler gave nearly all of his drug money to Ted, and Walt has one of the biggest meltdowns of any character in the whole show. Ah! <laughs> 
Everything in this scene is literal perfection. From the top-notch acting from Brian Cranston and Anna Gunn, to the amazing score that accompanies the scene perfectly and emphasizes the fear and helplessness that both Walt and Skyler feel, to the iconic shot of Walt settling down in the middle of the crawl space, as the camera pans out and the music morphs into a high-pitched screech, like a voice is screaming in Walt's head. I've heard many people write off crawl space only getting a high rating because of its amazing ending, but trust me when I say, this episode is much more than meets the eye. It sets up the last last two episodes of this season perfectly, and is chock full of fantastic and incredibly entertaining scenes. I'm a huge fan of episodes that have a little bit of everything that makes the show great, and Crawl Space, along with Better Call Saul's winner, are what I consider to be the absolute shining examples of these types of episodes. Every aspect of this episode is a 10 out of 10, and I will never understand why HN put it so fucking low on his list. Though to be fair, I don't think the rest of the opinions in this video are gonna leave a much better taste in your mouth. Anyways, thank you very much to HN for giving me this Soul Gone-ass cameo. And if you liked my stupid-ass segment, make sure to go take a look at my channel. Take care. Number 16, Pimento. This episode drops a bombshell that Chuck has been against Jimmy all along, and goddamn, I think it might just be my favourite scene in the entire series, which I know I've said a million times, but this time I mean it. This might be a hot take, but I would say this Chuck rant is even better than the one in Chicanery. All Jimmy wanted his entire life was the approval of his brother, to be his equal, and to find out that not only has Chuck secretly resented him this entire time, but was actively working to undermine him is just too much. It also shows just how much of a baby Chuck really is, considering he acts like Jimmy didn't have to put in any work compared to him, even though he's fully aware that Jimmy worked tirelessly to put himself through law school without any help and while working at HHM. This must have taken you years, and you kept it a secret all this time. And on top of all of that, Jimmy was doing quality lawyer work these past few episodes, but Chuck is just too blinded by his bias to see it. Like I mentioned before, it's amazing how unexpected this twist is, but also how obvious it is when you look back at Chuck's actions throughout the season. Because I always do, it's a habit, right? <laughs> so it was nagging me, it was nagging me! On the mic side of things, we get the introduction of the best character in the entire show, and one of the all-time great Mike moments, where he disarms Trevor and makes him his bitch. Even Man Mountain is impressed. This scene where Mike gives Price a pep talk about being a criminal sums up his philosophy pretty much perfectly, and is the exact opposite of Chuck's rant in regards to how each of them view the law. Chuck's reaction to Howard denying Jimmy his job at HHM is just hilariously bad, and man I feel bad for Howard not just in this episode but pretty much the entire show. The guy was just trying to run a decent law firm and kept having to deal with Chuck's petty beef with Jimmy until it destroyed everything. This episode manages to balance the devastating moments with the comedy moments so well as easily my favourite episode of season 1. Number 15. Ozymandias. Now I know what you're thinking. The greatest TV episode of all time, perfect 10 rating on IMDb, and here it is barely making the top 10 on my list. So yeah, this isn't my favourite episode, but I'm not saying it's bad or anything like that. I totally get why this is everyone's favourite, since it's probably the heaviest episode yet in terms of major plot developments, and seeing Walt's entire world fall apart around him is something we've been waiting for since the beginning. The opening takes us back to the first episode, back when everything was fine and dandy, and at the same location where the characters now find themselves. Hank's last moments aren't exactly what he was probably expecting, but it's nice that he held his ground instead of turning into a blubbering crybaby like Walt. I can't even really take the shot seriously anymore, and you can thank the internet for that. Walt idiotically lets the Nazis know that there's 80 mil buried in the ground. It's $80. So they take all of it except for one barrel, because Uncle Jack's just such a nice guy. Walt decides that this is all actually Jesse's fault, and takes his anger out on him by finally revealing that he let Jane die, which further solidifies Walt as the biggest c alive. Meanwhile, Marie assumes everything is going great for Hank right now, so she struts into the car wash to give Skylar the good news, and also to make her finally tell Junior the truth. Eventually, they get back home at the same time as Walt, who tries to keep doing his usual everything's gonna be fine spiel, but Skylar assumes he murdered Hank, and he doesn't do a very good job at trying to deny it. Things escalate into an all-out brawl, and even Junior gets involved, before Walt finally realises how much of a fuck-up he is. He runs off and kidnaps Holly as well, because reasons. Meanwhile, Jesse has become a literal slave living in a Nazi cage, which is kind of ridiculous, but whatever. Later on, Walt calls up Skylar to go on another Sigma male rant, but eventually it becomes obvious he's doing it to clear her name, because he's just such a nice guy. He gets mad at Holly because she wants her mummy back and dumps her in a fire truck, and then heads off to get a new vacuum cleaner. So that's Ozymandias, and like I said, it's clear why this is the number one for so many people. But for me, the last few episodes of this list just speak to me more. And at the end of the day, they're all 10 out of 10s anyway, so who really cares? Number 14, Face Off. 
The finale of season 4 is just pure awesomeness. It's got it all. Suspense, intense showdowns, funny moments, and one of the best plot twists out there. Right after his little bomb experiment failed, Walt grabs it and takes it into the hospital, which Jesse doesn't seem to approve of. Walt needs Jesse to think of a new place to blow up Gus, but he's interrupted by the cops waltzing in to take Jesse away. Walt runs off to get Saul, but only finds Francesca instead. This is honestly my favourite scene of the episode, where Walt tries to do his Heisenberg thing with Francesca, but she's not having any of it, calling him out for being a dummy, and managing to convince Walt that he's going to need 20 grand to fix the door he broke through. So now he has to go on a detour back to his house to get the money, and narrowly avoids being capped by Frank's goons along the way. Saul meets up with Jesse who tells him about Gus's trolling of Hector, and Saul relays the info to Walt. He realises the two are enemies and cooks up a new plan, by having Hector go to the DEA to troll them and draw Gus's attention, leaving him with no choice but to execute Hector before he supposedly rats him out. The scene of Gus preparing himself to put an end to Hector is amazing, with Goodbye by Apparite playing over it, which just fits so well. Unfortunately for Gus, the guy who he'd been planning to kill for the past 20 years got the upper hand in the end, and he doesn't realise he's being trolled until it's too late. The death of Gus is so ridiculous in a good way, and it's one thing I think the show did better than Better Call Saul, in terms of the death of a main villain. My friend who I was watching with somehow hadn't had this scene spoiled, and his reaction was legendary. Walt sets off on his victory lap, meeting up with Jesse and burning the super lab down. Jesse finds out that Brock wasn't poisoned by Ryson after all, and it was actually some plant called Lily of a Valley. Walt drives off triumphantly after telling Skylar he won, and then we see the background of a house and... Wait a second. Number 13. Half Measures After finding out about Gus's connection to the dealer guys who got Combo killed, Jesse goes out on his own to get revenge. He plans to use Wendy to get some rice and lace burgers to the dealers, but when he tells Walt about his scheme, Walt is too afraid of getting in Gus's bad books to help him with it. Walt's worried about Jesse doing something rash, and cooks up some half-baked scheme to get him arrested so he can calm down in jail. Maybe Walt's worst plan in the whole show. Mike shows up at his house to set him straight, and reveals he actually works for Gus. Then he launches into the No Half Measures monologue, which is hands down his best scene in not just this show, but probably Better Call Saul as well. Jonathan Banks' delivery is just on point, and thankfully Walt doesn't have any annoying interjections. This scene instantly took Mike from a cool side character to a fan favourite. How to make a pimento cheese sandwich. Buy yourself some pimento cheese and some white bread. You take two slices of bread, and you spread the correct amount of cheese, like so. Then, you close, and you're done. Jesse manages to get some ricin off the internet somehow, but when he and Wendy try to execute the plan, Mike and Victor show up to take Jesse to the chicken farm, where Gus gives him a stern talking to. Jesse doesn't back down until Gus tells the dealers no more children, so they shake on it and everything's all good. Unfortunately, it turns out they took the no children thing a bit too literally. I'm seeing a lot of people say that Gus did really mean for that kid to be executed, but I think it's more likely that it was just the dealer guys acting out because of their c**t. Anyway, Jesse finds out and heads off to get revenge, even though it's a 2v1, but thankfully Walt comes to the rescue and murders both of them in cold blood, ending on one of the coolest moments in the show. Run. There's also this intriguing scene of Marie jerking off Hank. Number 12. Bad Choice Road. After an episode as crazy as Bagman, it would have been totally logical for the writers to reel things in a bit for this episode, but instead they went whole hog. The split screen something stupid montage makes a return, and Jimmy and Mike get some new drip. I have got to find out Mike's skincare routine. Jimmy gets Lalo out of jail, and Lalo compliments him on his ability to pick up women. Kim clearly doesn't buy Jimmy's story about what went down in the desert, even after his harrowing confession of having to drink his own piss. Jimmy has an epic fail in court, and Oakley mocks him for it because he's a dick. Mike gives Jimmy a pep talk about choices and roads, as well as dropping some hints on what will happen to Lalo, but Jimmy isn't entirely grateful for the advice. Gus and Mike discuss their battle plan moving forward, and Gus continues to be the biggest Nacho hater on the planet. Kim has a moment of clarity at work and quits Schweikart and Coakley on the spot, and I love how we don't get to hear her say it but instead figure it out from Rich's reaction. Nacho is tasked with the job of chauffeuring Lalo around as he does his detective work, 
and we get some more of his insane parkour skills. I really dig the score during this scene, which ends up being used as Lalo's theme throughout the rest of the show. And then we arrive at the main event, while Jimmy and Kim are arguing about her decision to quit, Lalo shows up for an interrogation session. It's a great detail that Jimmy tells the story differently each time Lalo gets him to repeat it, to make the lie more believable. When Kim joined in to start roasting Lalo, the scene suddenly gets a thousand times more tense, because it really feels like Lalo's just gonna pop a cap in her at any moment. This scene is nearly 12 minutes of perfect writing and acting, and will definitely go down as one of the best moments of this show. Number 11 Full measure. Continuing right where we left off, Walt waits in the desert to explain himself to Gus, who isn't too pleased with his little hit and run. Walt uses his facts and logic to explain why it isn't worth killing him and Jesse, and they should just continue work as usual, and Gus relents because he's a good boss, on the condition that he gets to choose the next assistant. Walt returns to work and lo and behold, Gail is back, who later gets visited by Gus to tell him about Walt's cancer, and how he needs to master the Heisenberg recipe before he dies. Meanwhile, Mike goes on a stealth mission to dispose of some guys who are messing around with Gus's operation, and we're introduced to everyone's favourite character, Chow. This scene is like completely unrelated to the rest of the episode, but it's cool as hell so I'll let it slide. After that he goes to Saul to find out where Jesse is, but Saul's too good a lawyer to let it slip, at least until Mike threatens him. Their relationship sure has come a long way since the sticker days. Turns out the address Mike gets is bogus, and Jesse's really holed up at Price's laser tag joint, where he and Walt try to figure out what they're gonna do. Walt decides their only option is to dispose of Gale. When he goes to get the job done, he gets caught immediately, and dragged over to the laundry to be executed. This scene where Walt begs for his life and then flips the table on Mike is just so damn thrilling, and it's one of those few moments where Walt genuinely feels like a badass. Just what the hell was that, exactly? You might want to hold off. Yeah? Why? Because your boss is gonna need me. 6353 Juan Tobo, apartment 6. Yeah. Even Mike is impressed. Unfortunately, it's now up to Jesse to kill Gale, leaving us on yet another painful cliffhanger. Thank god I watched the show after it was over, because there's no way I'll be able to wait a year after an ending like that. I could barely handle the six weeks after plan and execution. Number 10. Four days out. Before I started writing this video, I thought for sure that this was going to take the number one spot, because four days out is, for a lack of a better word, perfect. It's like a time capsule of that brief period in the show where Walt and Jesse were on good terms, just happily cooking their shit in the middle of the desert together. The vast majority of the episode is just for two of them playing off each other, and it's a joy to watch. The montage of their cooking session set to one by one by the Black Seeds is fantastic, with some really great time-lapse shots and some of the most iconic images of the series. Walt and Jesse's moment of celebration after they realise they've hit the jackpot is infectious, but the episode really gets going when they go to drive off to Denny's but the RV won't start. The double whammy of Jesse leaving the keys in the ignition, and then later dumping all the water over the fire is painful to watch. And it leads to Walt giving up and rambling about death and all that, until Jesse shakes him out of it and gives him a pep talk for the ages, saying they should build a dune buggy or a robot. Walt's boring and decides to build a battery instead, and with the help of Jesse's genius science skills, they're finally able to get the RV going again. Other great scenes include Saul laughing at Walt for having no money to launder, and the last scene where Walt has a gamer rage after finding out he's in fact not going to die in the next few weeks. Overall, an instant classic episode that really solidified the show as an all-time great one for me. Number 9. Fly. Yes, I put Fly over Ozymandias, and it's because Fly somehow manages to tick all the boxes for what I want out of an episode of this show. Ryan Johnson is our man of the hour here, and he really directs the hell out of this episode. There's so many cool angles and impressive camera moves that keep it interesting with the whole runtime, which is a feat considering basically the entire thing takes place in one location. It's just a shame that Ryan never got the chance to direct a Better Call Saul episode, since he was too busy ruining everyone's childhoods. We all know how funny this episode is, but it also has some amazing character moments, like Jesse telling the story about a possum that was living under his aunt's house. This whole monologue is like 3 minutes long, and it's mostly just one shot slowly dollying in on Jesse. And then it's immediately followed up by an even better monologue from Walt, where he reflects on how much he's fucked up, and what the perfect moment for him to peace out would have been. I feel like I don't need to mention Brian Cranston's acting, because we all know it's next level, but I seriously think this episode might be his best work. Things get really heavy when Walt brings up the night Jane died, and we met her father at the bar and all that. He goes on a Rick and Morty spiel about how the universe is random, and then comes insanely close to confessing what he did that night while Jesse's trying to kill the fly on a ladder. You can feel the genuine remorse from Walt in this scene, which is such a sharp contrast to his demeanour when he eventually does tell Jesse the truth. 
We also get to see how Jesse has grown, with him accepting that it's not his fault, or Jane's fault, or anyone's. Except obviously we know that it actually is someone's fault. I think this episode's connection to Phoenix is a big part of why I love it so much. Like, you just heard me go on about how awesome that episode is. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum, you have the early scenes where Walter's trying to catch a fly, which are obviously hilarious. And when Jesse shows up, it gets even better, with him being dumbfounded by Walt's obsession with one little insect. But by the end of the episode, Jesse is even more dedicated to destroying it than Walt, with him getting to land the killing blow, filmed in glorious, ultra-slow motion. I love episodes of television like that, where just a few characters are forced to remain in a single location, because there, there's so much opportunity to, to, to reveal... Um, character stuff and relationship stuff and power dynamics and shifting um, intentions and it's it's incredible because what it does is it reduces the size of of spectacle right you don't need giant explosions or you know beautiful gorgeous vistas of the New Mexican mountains yeah uh, the scale gets shrunk down to this one room so that even even little moments become huge when he falls from the <laughs> when he falls from the catwalk or whatever onto the onto the ground you know in another episode that could just be like a small thing but it was like this huge um horrible and hilarious uh moment so i love episodes like that and, and fly itself specifically was was exceptional I mean, ryan johnson is just an incredible director so yeah can you skip this episode and not miss anything of note story wise yes but if you did you'd be doing yourself a huge disservice number eight wexler v goodman after a couple of kinda average episodes to start off season 5, the writers drop this insane episode on us out of nowhere. With a title like Wexler v Goodman, you would have high hopes, and of course it delivers in every way imaginable. Jimmy assembles his elite film crew for his latest project, and after some arguing over how to go about it, they use a green screen and we get another delightful montage of Soul directing actors. Kim decides she wants to pump the brakes on the scheme, and Saul does seem to relent. Nacho finds out that Mike works for Gus and isn't impressed because Gus is a massive dickhead. Kim apologizes for the outburst she had in a previous episode, and because Rich is the best boss ever, he's cool with it. Mike does his Mike thing and gets this librarian to report Lalo's car and get him arrested. Jimmy uses two hookers to troll Howie some more, and Cliff is there to see it all go down. And then we get the Mesa Verde meeting, with all the big players including Viola. Jimmy goes full Saul mode and bamboozles everyone, including Kim, who of course gets mad, but instead of dumping Jimmy, she drops a bomb that they should get married. I do find it kind of weird that Kevin Wachtel doesn't understand basic copyright law, and that this logo thing didn't ever come up in Mesa Verde's life, but it's still an amazing scene despite that. And the argument in Kim's apartment afterwards is even better, with her dropping an F-bomb almost as good as Howard's. Wait, how can you be the sucker? It was your plan. Oh. Fuck you, Jimmy! And on top of all of that, we get to see young Kim and her shitty mum in the cold open. This is just one of those episodes that's so much fun to watch unfold. Number 7. Plan and Execution This is currently the highest rated episode of the show, the only one with a 9.9 .9 rating on IMDb, and it's easy to see why. Jimmy and Kim's trolling against Howard finally all comes together, and it's really everything you could possibly want. The film crew returns one more time for a photo shoot, and it's a great send off to some of the best side characters in the show. Unfortunately, we never got to find out if they were the ones making the Soul commercials in Breaking Bad, but I guess he can't have everything. The reveal that Howard's PI was actually working for Jimbo and Kim all along was a pretty crazy moment, especially with how quickly it happened. The mediation at HHM goes down as terribly as you would expect, with pretty much all the major lore characters plus Irene Landry there to witness Howard's downfall. This is his last episode in the spotlight, and Patrick Fabian just nails every single scene. He does seem to convince Cliff that it's all Jimmy's fault, but it doesn't end up mattering because the clients are more important at the end of the day. Meanwhile, Lalo's back from his vacation in Germany and has finally zeroed in on the laundry, where of course the half-finished lab is under it. He gives Hector a call but realizes that Gus is onto him, which causes him to have a game of rage before coming up with a new idea. Howard's confrontation with Jimmy and Kim is incredible, with Patrick Fabian giving a genuinely Emmy-worthy performance, even though the Emmys hate the show. I sided with Chuck too often. I took away your office. Put you in doc review. Howard's daddy helped him get to the top, but you both had to struggle. Howie has so much, and we have so little. Let's take him down a peg or two. Oh, yeah, sure. The Sandpiper settlement, HHM share, will be substantial, absolutely. Even though I humiliated myself, and my clients and peers will whisper that Howard Hamlin's a drug addict. You're right. Jimmy, you can't help yourself. Chuck knew it. You were born that way. But you, 
one of the smartest and most promising human beings I've ever known. And this is the life you choose. I, I thought you did it for the money, but now it's, it's so clear. Screw the money. You did it for fun. You get off on it. You're, you're like Leopold and Loeb, two sociopaths. All right, that's enough. Oh, you know it's true. You just have the guts to admit it. I've never hated Jimmy and Kim more than in this scene, and I was really looking forward to Howard getting his revenge until the candle flickers and Lalo comes in to ruin it. The first time watching this episode, it was just unbelievable that Howard and Lalo were in the same shot together, to the point where I thought it was like a fan edit. And unfortunately, Howard gets unceremoniously capped by Lalo, leaving us on the most painful cliffhanger ever. Okay. Talk. Thomas Schnauz and the rest of the writers brought these two plot lines together in such an unexpected but natural way, and it might just be the best writing in the entire show. <laughs> Number 6. Felina. Here it is, the series finale. Probably the go-to example when it comes to any discussion on the best TV endings. Up there with Game of Thrones and House of Cards for sure. And yeah, it is really as good as everyone says. I actually do have more issues with it than most other episodes this high on the list, but the impact is just so strong that it all just doesn't matter. From the literal cold open in the car all the way to the last scene in the compound, every moment is pure satisfaction. I love just about every scene here, so I'll just go over my favourites. Walt visiting Gretchen and Elliot to troll them and give them his money so they can deliver it to his kids is hilarious, with him basically scarring them for life with his laser pointer chicanery. I like this flashback dream thing with Jesse making his box that he talked about back in Problem Dog, before the smash cut to him stuck in the Nazi compound. I appreciate how fucked up they made Jesse look in these last few episodes. It brings more realism to the ridiculous concept of him working as a slave for literal Nazis. Walt and Skylar's last conversation is hands down the best scene of the episode. With his confession that he did it all for himself, honestly, you're like making the entire show for me. I did it for me. I liked it. I was good at it. And I was really, I was alive. He gives Skylar the coordinates to Hank and Gomez's bodies, which we know thanks to Better Call Saul that she managed to get a deal with. The confrontation at the Nazi compound is on the exact opposite end of the spectrum, with Walt saying screw it and just fucking shooting everyone with his machine gun contraption. He's nice enough to save Jesse from a crossfire, and he gets his revenge moment by strangling Todd, even though he brought him ice cream. Walt and Jesse's farewell look thing is cool, but if I was Jesse I'd probably run that over on the way out. And finally, Walt's story ends where he was at his peak, in a meth lab. Yeah, you could argue things turned out too good for Walt, and that he didn't deserve to win in the end, but I think it was the right choice. And the Baby Blue song is pitch perfect, perfectly timed to that last credit. Number 5. Fun and Games This is basically the series finale of the main era of Better Call Saul, with every episode after this being mostly Gene shenanigans. The opening montage with the Perfect Day song is amazing as usual, with some pretty funky transitions back and forth between Jimmy, Kim, and Mike's cleanup crew. Gus has a meeting with Don Eladio and the gang to discuss Lalo's murder, but Lalo did such a good job at faking his death that it ends up clearing Gus's name. This last scene of Gus and the wine guy was kind of controversial at first since it felt like it went on forever, but I think it's pretty much a perfect final scene for him, showing that even with the defeat of Lalo, he's still consumed by revenge, which would eventually lead to his downfall in Breaking Bad. It's also basically confirmation that Gus is gay, but people will still just keep denying it forever. Mike's last scene is also appropriate, with Nacho's father telling him the truth that he's become a soulless murder man working for a deranged psycho with no morals. Mike and Gus have finally become what they were in Breaking Bad, and I think it was a perfect way to end their stories. Meanwhile, Jimmy and Kim have to go to Howard's memorial at HHM, with some very charming photos of a man himself. Rich tells us that HHM is downsizing, and sums up the entire episode in four words. End of an era. Yeah. Jimmy is accosted by Cheryl about his trolling of Howard, and Kim steps in to gaslight to the fucking max. This is probably the lowest we've ever seen her go. Jimmy and Kim's breakup is truly heartbreaking, even if it felt inevitable. Odenkirk and Seahorn are both at the top of their game as expected. No, Kim, you're wrong! This is about Howard! Okay, what happened to him wasn't on us, it wasn't your fault, it wasn't my fault! It was that fucking Lalo Salamanca! And the way the scene unfolds is like one gut punch after another, and that hard cut to Jimmy in full Saul mode is just genius. I am a tiny bit salty that we didn't get to see how Saul got the Cadillac and the inflatable and the office renovations, but it really doesn't matter at the end of the day. 
What does matter is that this episode managed to tie up all the loose ends and not feel rushed, which is amazing considering where the story was just a few episodes ago. And goddamn, that final shot is the stuff of legends. Number 4. Granite State Sandwiched between two of her most beloved episodes, I feel like this one gets overlooked by a lot of people. It's all about our characters trying to deal with how shit everything's become after it all blew up last episode, and it perfectly sets the stage for the finale. This is the last time we see Saul in this show at least, with him showing up at the vacuum place to get shipped off to Omaha, but not before having to deal with Walt for a few more days. This final conversation between the two of them is my favourite Saul scene in Breaking Bad, and if we include Better Call Saul then it's definitely like top 5. He gives Walt one more bit of advice for old times sake, about how Skyler's fucked if he leaves, and he should stay in face for music. The scene was already great when it came out, but it's retroactively made like 10 times better by the fact that Saul's advice to Walt is exactly what he ends up doing in the end of his show. You walk in with your head held high, you'll be the John Dillinger of the Metropolitan Detention Center. How bad is that? Bob Odenkirk's acting in this scene is so good, and the last moment where Walt tries to pull his usual intimidation tactic and fails spectacularly is the icing on the cake. One thing I do have to bring up is I always took the part where Saul says he'll be managing a Cinnabon as just like a random thing off the top of his head, but then in Better Call Saul that's exactly what he ends up doing. Like, did he already know he was going to work at Cinnabon, or did he just decide to do it because it sounded like a good idea when he randomly thought of it? Doesn't really matter, it's just something I've always thought about. This is also the first and last episode where we see Ed the Disappearer, in this show at least. And for just one episode, Robert Forster really made his character a memorable one. All his scenes with Walt are excellent, especially the one where he visits Walt and gets paid 10 grand just to stay an extra hour. And he also has some of the funniest lines. Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium. Two copies. I'm not much of a movie guy. One thing I wish we got to see more of was the public's reaction to the whole Heisenberg thing, and we do get to hear some snippets about it here, with some newspaper clippings in Walt's cabin, and a couple bits of info that Ed tells us. Skylar's having a pretty miserable time as expected, with a little visit from Todd to add to the fun, and Jesse's living in hell. He tries to escape but runs right past the cameras like an idiot, which leads to maybe the worst death in the show. I honestly think this took Jesse's suffering too far, like he was already working as a slave for literal Nazis. Did they really need to throw a second dead girlfriend on top of a trauma pile? Walt eventually gets bored of his little goon cave and goes to a bar to call up Junior, who isn't too happy to hear his voice. Why are you still alive? Why will not you just, just die already? Just, just die. And so it looks like Walt's finally out of juice. He calls up the cops and waits for them to come to him, while he sits there drinking his dimple pinch. That is, until he sees something that triggers his precious ego, Gretchen and Elliot slandering him on the TV. The cops bust in moments later, but Walt's already long gone. This scene is without question my favourite in the whole show. Everything about it is just so perfectly executed, and it also has the most awesome use of a main theme song possible. The last shot where it dollies over to the whiskey glass perfectly timed to the last few notes of a song gives me chills every single time. Best ending to an episode without question, and Granite State is officially my pick for the best episode of Breaking Bad. Number 3. Chicanery what can be said about this episode that hasn't already been said a million times in a thousand different video essays? Chicanery is the culmination of the growing rift between Jimmy and Chuck, and it's perfection. Every single moment and line of dialogue is crucial. No time is wasted. This might be the most airtight script in the series. If you pay close enough attention, you could probably figure out exactly what Jimmy and Kim's plan is before Chuck even arrives to give his testimony, but even with that knowledge, it's still so satisfying to watch it all play out. This scene of Jimmy and Kim gearing up for the hearing while we hear the prosecutor's opening statement is very keno, and Kim's cross-examination of Howard has some great lines. Nepotism. Your firm is Hamlin, Hamlin, and McGill, right? Who's the other Hamlin? My father. Eventually, he was hired by the firm of Davis and Maine. I'd be happy to say more about that, if you'd like. No, thank you. We get the introduction of everyone's favourite cannibal, Huel, thanks to the ever-helpful Caldera. Once Jimmy gets to cross-examine Chuck, it's like a slow back and forth of who seemingly has the upper hand, until that final reveal of a battery in Chuck's pocket, where we realise Jimmy has been playing him the whole time. I love how throughout the episode you can see how much Jimmy hates that he has to do this to Chuck. You know, she's gonna hate you when this is over. Yep. And there's no look of satisfaction or joy on his face at the end, just pain. Chuck's rant at the end may be a giant meme at this point, but it's still one of the best moments in the show, with him finally letting out all his petty rage against Jimmy in front of everyone. Number 2. Winner
This was my pick for the best Better Call Saul episode in my last ranking, and I held that opinion up until my last rewatch. Everything I said about this episode last time still stands, it's just that one other episode emerges as my new favourite. Anyways, this episode is just perfect. It caps off the storylines from not just this season, but kind of a whole show up until this point, and it's one of the most important episodes for both Jimmy and Mike. Jimmy's plot sees him trying to amp up his reputation ahead of his big hearing, with several wacky schemes to aid him. The scene of him fake crying in front of Chuck's grave for any potential onlookers is hilarious. He literally says boohoo. Then we have the Charles McGill reading room, with Drama Girl going around gossiping about how Jimmy paid for the entire thing himself, out of the goodness in his heart. My favourite scene of the episode is the scholarship meeting, where Jimmy sticks his neck out for Christy Esposito, before she got into a bunch of world-ending shenanigans later in life. The obvious parallels between Jimmy and Christy's lives makes the whole thing more personal. I love how you can see how impressed Howard is, which he brings up in Season 5 when he's trying to give Jimmy a job. The following segment where Jimmy gives Christy a motivational pep talk is one for the ages, with him not so subtly just trauma dumping about how much of a loser he is, and then crying like a baby when his car won't start. At the end of the day though, it all works out when Jimmy makes his appeal to the bar committee, touching the hearts of all of us, until it all turns out he was just trolling as usual, leaving us on maybe the best ending to any episode. Wait, wait, Jimmy, Jimmy, what? It's all good, man. Meanwhile in Mike land, he's on the hunt for Werner after his little runaway last episode. I of course love seeing Mike doing his usual detective work, but it's made even better by Lalo's pursuit of him. Lalo's detective methods are slightly different to Mike's, but they turn out to be even more effective since he's able to get to Werner before him. My other favourite scene in this episode is definitely when Mike's being followed by Lalo and goes into this car park to lose him. That bit where you see him reaching for what you assume is a gun and it turns out to just be chewing gum is great, and the way it's used is low-key genius. Of course, Verna acts like an idiot when he's finally caught, and Gus is a dickhead as usual so Mike has to finish him off. The scene is so simple yet so powerful at the same time. It's pretty much the conclusion of Mike's arc, and after this he doesn't really have much to do for the rest of the show, beyond cleaning up other people's messes. And lastly, this episode is Chuck and Jimmy singing ABBA together, which solidifies it as an instant classic. Easily one of the best episodes of a show. But not the best. Number 1. Saul. Gone. I was already a huge fan of a Better Call Saul finale from the moment I first saw it, but after my most recent rewatch of the entire Breaking Bad universe, ending with this episode made it hit insanely hard. So hard that I've realised it's my favourite episode, period. The emotional highs this episode gives me just cannot be described. Almost every scene makes me incredibly happy, extremely depressed, or both at once. It's probably because I've been following the show for several years, but this finale made me feel far more emotions than Felina ever did, and I already talked about how good that episode is. Before this episode aired, the one thing I knew I wanted was the redemption of Jimmy McGill, and hopefully with some courtroom drama thrown in for good measure, and I ended up getting pretty much exactly what I wanted, which is probably why it hit so hard for me. I love literally every scene in this episode, but if I had to pick a couple favourites, it would be the opening scene with Mike, which is a great send off for him, the scene where Marie showed up, which was this crazy moment to see live, like who the hell was expecting Marie? It did make me slightly disappointed that Skylar didn't get him a mix, but there's probably already enough Breaking Bad cameos anyway. The Walt scene is one that I had some reservations about the first time I saw it, but I've grown to appreciate it more with subsequent watches. I like seeing him acting like a complete loser at Saul to distract himself from how his life literally just fell apart, and that moment with Jesse's watch is pretty cool as well. Plus this line is incredible. So you were always like this. The Chuck scene was easily the most hype moment of the entire show for me, since I so desperately wanted to see his return one more time before the show ended, and damn did the writers manage to come up with the most depressing final note to end their story on, with Chuck trying to reach out to Jimmy, but the relationship is so strained that Jimmy is just incapable of seeing this opportunity as anything more than another chance for Chuck to hate on him. But my absolute favourite scene of the episode, and maybe the whole series, has got to be the courtroom sequence. We get to see Saul call himself out for all the shit in Breaking Bad, which is already cool enough, but then the moment that really got me going was when he finally admitted to being the one who fucked up Chuck's malpractice insurance, and basically leading him to suicide. And the icing on the cake is that last moment where he finally refers to himself by his real name. Sit down and stay seated. The name's McGill. I'm James McGill. This whole scene is just so cathartic, especially as someone who's following the show and constantly theorizing and talking about it online. Your Honor, I'd like to petition to withdraw from this case. Denied. Well, respectfully. Not a I chance. Then there's the bus scene which is pretty amusing, and meant to top it all off, 
the last scene of Kim and James reuniting. The non-subtle callbacks to the first episode are so satisfying, especially Dave Porter's score tying it all together. I honestly wish the show ended right here with this is the last shot, but Peter Gould explained why he didn't end it like that, and it makes sense. Basically, he didn't want the ending to show the two of them together, but apart instead. And that's where not just this show ends, but the entire Breaking Bad franchise. Hopefully. Hearing that end credit song for the first time, knowing that it was truly over, made me feel all sorts of emotions that I don't want to get into, but just let it be known that this was the perfect ending for this show and the character of Jimmy McGill, and it's officially my pick for the best episode of the Breaking Bad universe. And at last, we're done. 133 episodes later, hopefully you found at least something you can agree with here. I know my opinions can be slightly unconventional sometimes, but I'm not trying to be a contrarian or anything, this is just what my real thoughts are. Anyways, let's just rank all the seasons real quick. Yep, Soul Season 1 is still the king for me. All of these are really close and none are truly bad. Except for one of them. I want to thank everyone who stuck around with this channel over the past year and a half. My upload schedule has been less than consistent, and to be honest, I don't know if it's ever going to get any better. Hopefully the videos you did get were worth the wait, and I still do have a couple more ideas in the tank for now at least. If you have any suggestions for videos, be sure to let me know. And be sure to leave lengthy comments explaining why my opinions are wrong in the comment section below. Special shoutouts as always to Johnny Cooper, and to Beat Rice, who took time away from making his mid-tier list videos to give us his thoughts on Crawl Space. With all that said, I'll see you all in the new year, where greener pastures await. Thanks for watching.